recording. Yes, you are. Um, and so I would like to call the uh, Thursday, November 9th, 2023, Colorado Produced Water Consortium meeting to order. Uh, appreciate everyone attending here today. I know folks are coming from all over the state. We also have uh, a number of consortium members online. Um, uh, there is a, a, a rash of COVID and sickness that's going on. And so uh, uh, really appreciate folks still being willing to participate online um, and uh, doing the right thing by not coming in and, uh, you know, when they're not feeling well. And so we'll certainly do everything we can, uh, those of you who are online, <clears throat> Uh, to be able to engage you in the process today uh, and certainly utilize the chat function uh, in the Zoom meetings uh, or raise your hand uh, if we're not doing a good job of engaging you or uh, you think it's important that your voice is heard because your voice is important. Um, but I do want to welcome everyone and really appreciate the participation here today. Um, today's agenda uh, is laid out in front of us. I want to I want to talk just a little bit about today and you know, what we're hoping to accomplish. Um, I think I think a lot of us are starting to feel the pressure of you know what we need to accomplish with the Produced Water Consortium and the timelines that were developed in the legislation to accomplish a lot of these things. And um, you know, dates are starting to come up quicker, and a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, at the same time, I think it's really important that we take the time to be able to develop consensus around our strategic priorities and our strategic results and really set up a blueprint uh, on how we're going to be able to accomplish these things in a methodical manner. It's really a, a go slow to go fast process. And so today is day two of our strategic planning process. And in that strategic planning process, we've currently been able to accomplish two of our strategic priorities. Um, it took all day for us to accomplish those two strategic priorities. Well, really one strategic priority because the legislative strategic priority was really laid out for us. Today, we're going to try to accomplish the last three strategic priorities and results um, in about an hour and 15 minutes each. So we're compressing that entire day that it took us to do one into about an hour and 15 minutes. What that does mean is that we're going to have to be really deliberate and focused in, you know, how we approach these, how we, um, um, how we talk about, you know, the different strategic priorities. Try to be, um, try to be focused in in what we're doing, and try not to go down too many rabbit holes. And to that light, uh, Darcy and Marv, managing results, are here with us today, and they're going to be very proactive in their facilitation today to make sure that they keep us on track towards developing those strategic uh, results associated with the priorities that we've identified. Um, and when I say proactive, they're gonna, they're gonna push a little hard. So um, I, I, I'm as guilty as anyone as far as going down rabbit holes and, and wanting to have these you know, bigger, broader discussions. But I think in this strategic planning um, effort, not trying to quash any voices. And so that's really important for me to emphasize and that's not the intent but just to make sure that we're really focused on, you know, developing a, a strategic results, um, you know, in the time that we have allotted and understanding that, and Marv and Darcy will talk a little more about this, but the strategic priorities, the strategic results are like two pieces of a five piece puzzle. And in the implementation plan, there's additional steps that will need to be taken that further refine our strategic priorities, our strategic results in order to get to, you know, really um, specific actionable items. I'm not going to ask this group to group think those very specific actionable items. What I am going to do is have this group develop consensus around strategic priorities, strategic results, and then allow um, hope to be able to start to develop the implementation plan from the strategic results that we've developed. And then she'll present those to uh, the consortium for reaction and to make sure that that implementation plan um, is on track and, uh, and that we can build consensus around that um, at a future meeting. And so um, 
So with that, uh, again, super excited to be here. Um, and uh, I'm also on the Jefferson County Planning Commission and was in planning commission hearings until 1230 last night. And so I may not totally be here this morning, but um, uh, but I'm looking forward to the conversation today and looking forward to uh, uh, hearing folks thoughts. And so um, so with that, I'm going to kick it off to Hope for uh, just some announcements and some housekeeping. And just so folks know, we are we are we're public facing right now. We've got um, folks that uh, have joined us not only from our consortium but uh, from the public as well. And so, um, uh, and so, just to be aware that uh, that we hold these meetings in public for transparency, and so the public are able to. Um, know the work that we're doing. Thank you, John. We are on a fast time frame, but I do want to <clears throat> take a moment and congratulate us for getting through the strategic results for our first two strategic priorities, education and legislation. Thank you for those of you who have already looked at the strategic um, plan, the draft, and um, I really appreciate that. Because we're moving so fast today, feel free to email me if you have a thought after the meeting, okay? Um, housekeeping, I've gotten signatures from many of you for reimbursements, and uh, if you still need to give me your signature, please meet me at one of the breaks, um, definitely before you leave. <laughs> the bathrooms are down the hall, and then there was a request, John, for all of us to state our names um, for the record. Is that okay with you? Um, sure, yeah, we can go around the room and um, uh, introduce ourselves again quick, uh, both for members of the public, as well as I think for Darcy, who's joining us for the first time for managing results. Um, and so maybe Jeff, you can start. Welcome. This is, uh, I'm Jeff Kirtland. I'm representing industry from the Western Slope Peons Basin. Thank you. Irene Andrus, um, representing environmental justice. Mark Hefta, representing industry on the on the DJ Basin. Grant Tupper, representing industry uh, through the DJ Basin. Trisha Pfeiffer, representing the federal government, US EPA Region 8. Uh, James Rosenblum, representing an academic seat from Colorado School of Mines. Emma Pinter, uh, Adams County Commissioner, representing local government. Doug White, NGL Water Solutions, DJ, uh, representing Produce Water Expertise. Good morning, Brandy Honeycutt, representing the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Pete McMahon, representing the federal government with the U.S. Geological Survey. Kevin Chan, representing nonprofits for communities and um, impacted communities. Uh, John Messner, Commissioner with Energy and Carbon Management Commission. Joe Ryan here from University of Colorado Boulder, rec representing academia. Zahi Kath, uh, representing academia, Colorado School of Mines. Jolie Bronner, representing environmental justice. Tessa Sorensen, energy liaison with Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and governing body member. Good morning, Ember Michael, disproportionate communities. Good morning, Michalina Pollock. I'm, I'm representing industry in the San Juan Basin. Good morning, Eric Anglin with Occidental Petroleum, representing uh, experience and uh, expertise in produced water. Good morning, John Heil, Northwest Environmental Protection Specialist and representing the ECMC. I'm Darcy Perkins with Managing Results. Marv Widener, Managing for Results. Hope Dalton, Director of the Consortium. Aaron Ray, Assistant Director for Energy DNR. Barbara Vasquez, representing Western Colorado Alliance. Uh, Clay, you want to introduce yourself quick? Yes, Clay Terry, Natural Resource Advisor, is representing uh, Produce Water Expertise. Thank you. Okay, Thomas. Thomas Ball, Colorado State University, representing Academia. Nikki. I am Nikki Wells, representing a nonprofit organization and disproportionate neighborhood. Uh, Jacob. 
Good morning, Jacob Smith with Colorado Communities for Climate Action, a coalition of local governments around the state. Uh, Chloelle? Chloelle Danforth with the Health, with the Health Effects Institute. Uh, Representing NGO. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Mike Freeman with Earth Justice, representing environmental NGOs. Okay. Uh, Kyle? Hi, everybody. Assistant Attorney General Kyle Davenport representing the consortium. Uh, Tracy? Tracy Kozla, Colorado State Engineer's Office and Governing Body Member. Oh, and Zahi's right here, so Zahi's not actually there. Um, uh, great. So that is us, and uh, I'm going to kick it off to, to Marvin Darcy here in just one second. I do want to acknowledge that uh, Hope has been developing um, a library of information uh, of um, kind of background information on produced water that she's received from a number of different folks in this room, um, as well as uh, information from uh, an all-day um, presentation that we had at the then COGCC Commission um, on produced water. Uh, then a, a number of folks in this room um, also were presenters at that. Again, we've got a really tight timeline here. And so that I thought was a really good way to start to develop a background of information, a baseline of information from folks for folks in this room uh, as we start to make decisions around um, strategic planning and then ultimately start to make decisions around some of the deliverables that are associated with the legislature, legislation. Um, and so I, I know that the YouTube video that was sent was long. I know that uh, a lot, there was a lot of presentations and a lot of reports that were given, but I do encourage you to take the time to start to educate yourself because we are not gonna have enough time to provide that level of information uh, in person at meetings um, moving forward. We, we will have education, but that's already there. And, I, and so I, I would ask that you take advantage of that as homework uh, so that we can save some time moving forward here to be able to um, start doing the work we need to do. So um, with that, Marv Darcy, floor is yours. It's good to be back everyone. Uh, as John uh, uh, really illuminated for us, we have a very uh, short time frame to complete the strategic plan. And the reason for that is that the legislation has a number of, of benchmarks and milestones that have to be completed, you know, at a certain time. And some of those are coming right up, you know, literally within just a short number of months. And then they, you know, they also stack up one after another through the rest of, of 2024, right? So <clears throat> what we're gonna do today is uh, a little bit different than we did before. Uh, there was a lot more extended conversation, which was very valuable. And you all got to know an awful lot about each other and how you think and where you come from and how you, you know, articulate uh, the issues around produced water from your perspective. What we're going to do today is we're going to basically stand on that experience. We're going to lean hard into what you already know how to do, which is really focus on specific results that you want to see accomplish by priority, right? So we're going to lean hard on that experience and move right into working on the other three priorities. So we have basically just now under just uh, under four hours to do this. So in our facilitation, we may uh, you know ask you a question, but we may interrupt you a little bit, we may divert you, we may detour you, uh, but press forward, right? Um, bear with us. Uh, we will be uh, obviously respectful of what everyone is saying, but we ask you to keep your comments brief. Uh, with all of us in the room, with 31 members, uh, as we know, there's a lot of wisdom, experience, and perspective in the room. So in order to get to where we need to be today, which is strategic results for three priorities, 
we ask you to keep your comments brief and very much on point to what the topic is about, whether that's research or communities or legislation, et cetera. Uh, the other thing that we ask you to do is really focus on uh, uh, identifying results for this priority. We would ask you to really focus on um, getting to even your proposed results, right? So that we can respond to your ideas as a group. Um, so there'll be um, almost no just general conversation about the priority, but we're gonna go directly toward uh, developing specific results. The other thing that we suggest to you, I think we had four uh, results within education. Is, is that right? Am I right about that? I think four. Um, what we recommend for today is to get to two per priority, right? Now, a strategic plan is very much a working document. People don't think of it that way. You know, they think it gets put on, you know, you know, stone tablets or something. But you're going to be able to come back to the strategic plan over time, over the over the the length of the life of the consortium. And we'd even recommend that you do that every two years, right? So what we're thinking about today is the specific results within each priority. So we'd ask you to focus there. Uh, we'll probably start a little bit differently. We'll probably start uh, with some uh, conversation about what um, a particular priority is about, why it's a priority, and then we'll go directly then to strategic results. Everybody with me? All right, we'll try not to make this a forced march, but it's gonna be close. Is that right, everybody? Okay, so we've got just a few prior, uh, just a few slides here to kind of remind us of what we're doing. Jennifer, okay. Okay, so this is our this is this is our process. Um, I think you remember um, uh, my colleague uh, Jeremy presented back to you all of the information that we received in our interviews with you, and it was extensive and extremely valuable. When we ask you what are the most important issues, you really gave you really gave it you know uh, a lot of thought and were very articulate and we gave that back to you in the presentation last time. And then to identify the strategic priorities, you identified five major areas of focus for uh, the long-term work and to really give purpose to the legislation, if you will. Then within each of those, um, you're developed, you've developed strategic results for two of those. The next step really is about implementation, right? And this, John, where you were asking us to really talk about it. So <clears throat> a, a strategic plan is only as good as its implementation. I'll just say that. Remember the purpose of a strategic plan is to influence the future, right? The results have to come right off the page. They have to get uh, acted upon. They have to be operational. They require action and they require resources, right? So the next step, and I, uh, John, I think you laid this out very well. The whole group bringing all of your perspectives is really essential for the development of each of the strategic priorities and each of the strategic results. We can't, uh, we can't you know, divide you into small groups. The staff can't go off and write these things and then bring them back to you. It requires this kind of intense, all in, everybody here, all hands on deck to develop those. In terms of implementation, however, Oftentimes, small groups or staff can develop draft implementation strategies and bring those back to you as almost like you're a governing body, right? Bring those back to you, get your additional perspectives, and then really start working uh, the implementation process. So <clears throat> one thing I'd like, I'll just use, a, John asked me to do uh, an example this morning of what happens to a strategic plan. So let me use an extremely concrete example. We live in Gunnison County. We have a lot of snow. 
So let me use snow removal as an example, right? So <clears throat> here's what happens in a strategic plan and what happens when you have a result, right? So in Gunnison County, the Public Works Department for the county established a measure using this process a few years ago of removing the snow off of county roads before the school bus schedule. Think about that for just a minute, right? So why would you do that, right? Well, you do that so that kids can get to school on time, right? So schools can open. If kids can get on the school bus, their parents can also go to work or their parents can go open their business. Literally, the entire community and the economy of the community depends on the snow being removed from the roads before the school bus schedule. Do you see that, right? So what happens when you set a result like that? Well, you have to have the people in place, the staffing in place to be able to call everybody in when the snow is happening, right? You have to measure a readiness rate for the equipment because you know how many motor graders, trucks, pickups, all the rest. You know how many you have to have in place to beat that deadline every time it snows four inches, right? So what happens is, is you look at your assets and you figure out what you need in order to make that happen, right? That's what implementation planning is for this strategic plan. The other thing I will tell you is that when you have a strategic result, let's say it's removing the snow before the, the school bus is run, who are your partners to make that happen? Number one, the school, right? They have to know what you're going to do so that they can they can pull their buses out of the barn and expect that they can get down the road, correct? Right? Well, so what happens if you want to do that, but you don't write it into a strategic plan? You go talk to them about it, right? But until you, the public works department, write that down to say that's what you're committed to. It's just a conversation. So one of the things that happens when you have a strategic plan and you write down what results you're after, you're saying to your potential partners, the partners of the consortium, right? You're saying you're making a commitment and then when you work with them, whether they're regulators, legislature, or whoever it might be, you're asking them to help you achieve results that you're already committed to. And there's a big difference between you making a commitment in your strategic plan than there is just having a conversation, right? So sorry to use such a, a very plain example, but it's actually how it works, right? So when you have your strategic plan in place, you as a consortium are making commitments that your potential partners can understand and sign on to with you. The other thing about a strategic plan is it is a most powerful communication device. You will be able to tell everyone in the state of Colorado what this consortium is going to accomplish and why, right? There's nothing more powerful than being able to communicate your very purpose and what it is you're going to accomplish over the next few years. It really solidifies the value, the legitimacy of the consortium, okay? So this is really powerful stuff. And parallel to that, you've got some very specific deadlines that you need to meet that God bless you, Hope, you're gonna wrangle all of us and get it done, right? Right? All right, so with that, I don't think I really need to go into the rest of the, the slides. Uh, Jennifer, let's go, let's go forward to the slide that has um, legislation on the top of it, please. Uh, let's go back one, one slide, please. So we've checked off legislation, we've checked off education. This morning, because research is so closely uh, associated with education, we're going to we're going to pick up uh, on research first, okay? This morning, 
then we'll go to communities and then we'll go to regulations and policy and regulations and policy, as you said this morning, John, is going to be very closely tied with the legislation. So that may be a fast ending uh, is our hope. Okay. So we're not going to read through this, but Jennifer, you could go forward. This is what it looks like and hope. Thank you uh, very much for putting this all together. So the legislation a strategic priority is a listing of all the, the, the benchmarks and milestones that are in the legislation. Two more slides, please. Thank you. And then education. And here are the four strategic results that you identified. Um, Jeremy and I were really impressed and we don't usually blow smoke really um, and tell people how wonderful they are. But I'll tell you for a group that was just really starting to work together, and you come from so many different perspectives and you have so much diversity in your perspectives and your experience. We were really impressed that you as a group, as a team really developed these four strategic results. And that's the experience that we're gonna lean on today. Okay, all right. Um, and then one more, uh, just to remind us where we are. Okay, so let's talk about research. Okay, let's pick it right up. Let's do this, right? So <clears throat> research. Why is research one of your priorities? Let's let's have a brief discussion about this. Hey, when James, sorry, uh, when you're talking, just use the microphone so folks online can hear, but sorry. Uh, yeah, so James Rosenblum, um, uh, we need research to fill data gaps that exist to help us understand what we can use this water for, for its its you know purpose, if it's discharge, if it's reuse in the field and storing it. We just, there's a lot of knowledge gaps around that we need to fill to understand what we can use this water for. Thanks, Jason. And that was, that was discussed literally in every interview, uh, that there are very significant knowledge gaps. Uh, Tessa Sorensen, I think a corollary to that is to make sure that any recommendations the consortium makes are informed recommendations. Others about why this is a priority? No, I'm going to I'm going to push the academic folks to jump in on this one, because this is this is an important piece. And this is one that that. Um, you know, I think we heard loud and clear, particularly from researchers and academics, that this was a really important piece. And so I wonder if we could get uh, some feedback from Zahi and, and, and Thomas and Joe and Chloel uh, on, on this topic. Great. Yeah, this is exactly what we're hoping for, is really these brief kinds of comments about why this is a priority. And that will help us get directly to strategic results. So, John, thanks for the invitation to our our academic experts. Yeah, I think we've got Thomas up there sure. and uh, and Clay that have something to say. Thomas and Clay. Thomas, you want to go first? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so obviously I've been working on, on the research associated to evaluating the quality of produced water for reuse in agriculture for a while. There's still a lot of knowledge gaps. A lot of concerns about toxicity. I think some of the research knowledge gaps that needs to be filled is whether, you know, first of all, the extent to which we need to treat the water to prevent adverse impacts on soil health, crop health, and ultimately human health. And so I think uh, any research focused on how to evaluate toxicity would be essential for uh, the future of produced water reuse. Thank you, Thomas. Let's see. Clay, you have some thoughts? Yes, I <clears throat> thank you. I, I think uh, uh, agree with the whole concept of why we need research you know, to identify uh, and fill data gaps. Um, my my contribution in this context is to say we we need that research to help identify what's actually critical to be concerned with and what's not. Thank you, Coel. Uh, yeah, I just want to echo both what James and Thomas said about um, needing to understand toxicity and hazard of produced water, both to understand potential impacts to human health and the environment, but all, and treatment efficacy, which I think is exactly what Thomas just said. 
Um, but also uh, one of the, the key undertakings of the committee is, or the consortium is to actually understand how much water is being moved around, where it's coming from. Um, so, you know, there's spills and leaks are also an issue. Um, if we're gonna transport that, how we're gonna store it. So really just scoping the problem is, um, is I think <laughs> step one. Thanks, Koval. Brandy? Uh, yeah, I think that part of the research goal needs to be to avoid recreating the wheel. And so a baseline understanding of where produce water is being reused, how, um, how it's regulated, what's working and what's not working. Okay. All right. <clears throat> yes. Uh, Barbara Vasquez, WCA. I just wanted to echo some of these and pull them into one statement, and that is we need to balance the risk versus reward, the risk to human health and environment versus the opportunity to okay. reuse this resource. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. That was extremely succinct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> delivered too. Thank you so much. Yes. Hi, Irene Andrus. I think we need to know all of the sources and all the consumers and all of the infrastructure that's out there as well sources, so that we sources, have some idea about the logistics. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Ember Michael. <clears throat> um, I'd also like to use research to, identif to identify the differences in the basins across the state. And then as a second tier is to be able to provide information to all... <laughs> producers and users within the state, including um, the tribes that are within the state of Colorado and within the uh, United States. Yes, uh, Zahi Kab with School of Mines. Um, from the technological standpoint, um, uh, developing sustainable technologies that can work um, sustainably in, in this uh, tough environment. Um, so there's still you know, energy, and water quality aspects that needs to be improved. Sorry, Kevin. Um, I I would like to say that you know, as a community member, you know, we talk about um, you know, what what is a safe level or what what are current guidelines, um, versus what is you know. I, I guess it's when, when it comes to EPA water standards, you know, it, we're always learning. There's, there's always new studies coming out. Um, PFAS, for example, has gone down to uh, four parts per trillion instead of per billion. So just, you know, understanding that not everything, you know, we may not have all that information on acceptability of water quality and things like that. So, Yes. Sorry, I just wanted to add a term in here called the a qualitative or quantitative microbial risk assessment, which I guess chemicals would be part of that in, in this as well. But a lot of what we're saying in terms of like human health and environmental impacts, that's that would be embedded under that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Pete McMahon. I just wanted to reinforce what Ember had said. Um, I think understanding the spatial variability in both the uh, abundance and toxicity of produced water across the state would, would be helpful. Great coming from me, thank you, Peter. Helpful. Yes. Just a quick comment. There's a lot of talk about water and water quality. We also need to address air quality, particularly around uh, storage and transport. Do we have someone online? Guys. Yeah, Tracy. Tracy. Hi, thank you, Tracy Kozlov, State Engineer's Office. Uh, when we talk about research, I wonder if Colorado wants to consider the use of produced water for drinking water, or if we're just considering the use of produced water for other non-potable uses. It seems <clears throat> that the bar of the amount of research you would have to do if you weren't considering human consumption would be lower, there would be less. And I don't know the answer. I just want to pose that as a potential limit on their research if we're not going to consider human consumption. Yes. I have a question. I don't know. Sorry. Ember Michael. Um, it may fall in this bracket, but reading through the definitions within the house bill, it uh, loosely defines recycled and reused produced water. 
And then within the um, produced water report, it provides a little bit more clarity and definition around reuse and recycling, which is maybe somewhat of what Tracy had just kind of mentioned, but wondering if we could define those two uses um, where it says recycling is within the oil field and reuse is outside of the oil field, which could also lead to like drinking water standards. So just wondering if we could better define that. Thank you. So everyone, um, with your permission, I'm going to kind of stop the discussion right now. Uh, this has been extremely helpful. Let's put these up on the on the wall if we could, Darcy. Um, and we'll just quickly review what what we heard. Right. Um, there are lots of data and knowledge gaps, and that was fundamental to much of what you know all of you said about. Uh, the lack of, of data and research in various areas of concern around produced water, right? Ensure recommendations are informed, concerns about toxicity, I'm going quickly here, uh, research needed to ID what is critical and what is not, understanding how much um, water is actually being moved, how it's being stored, et cetera, uh, balance the risk uh, versus rewards, uh, sources, consumers, and infrastructure, uh, obviously a, a very broad uh, you know, umbrella of, of approach to research. Uh, identify the differences between the basins, uh, develop sustainable technologies, right? Uh, also, uh, concerns about the research around or lack of research around human health standards, uh, microbiome, uh, and standards, uh, stay, may, moving standards and staying current. Of course, I'm not phrasing this correctly, but you all heard it. Uh, qualitative versus quantitative research. Uh, research around air quality, water quality, uh, recycled uses, uh, consumption versus uh, non-potable, uh, and, and define reuse versus recycle. So there are lots of really fundamental important questions uh, in the context of research that have not been answered. And you've identified many of the topics, areas around that. Um, and John, I'm leveraging something that you said earlier this morning. I'm wondering if, uh, just I'm asking you, is there, a, is there a result around ongoing identifying the gaps in knowledge and data? Is that something that the consortium would want to lay out as a result to identify what those gaps are and then also make you know proposals for how to close those gaps. Yes, sir. So uh, some of us are part of the Department of Energy, uh, um, the, cons the consortium uh, now with the National Alliance for Water Innovation. And as part of the creation of, of NAWI, um, we went to, Two, three, three years ago, uh, through a road mapping oh. process on different types of water, uh, from desalination to the power industry, but there was focus on produced water in the mining industry. So I, I think you know we have to be careful not to reinvent the wheel here Absolutely. because there is a lot of knowledge there on the research gaps, um, specifically for the oil and gas. You know, I think, Sasi, the other thing that you're experiencing is that some of you may know a great deal about the research and data in one area, but the rest of the consortium hasn't gotten there yet, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm not I'm not hearing that you necessarily want to do the basic research yourselves as a consortium. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Probably don't want to reinvent the wheel. So I, I think that's that's point, for sure, right? Because there's a lot of research out there, yeah. a lot of data out there, but that's not necessarily you know visible to everybody here yet. Yeah. And I would just chime in that you know it's what what knowledge there is in some basins in these roadmaps are different from let's say our basins from different parts of the state from. If it's reuse, I'm going to call it inside the oil field for storage. How do we store that water? How can we collect the water safely, move it safely in you know you know communities where their people are living versus other parts of the country or even basins versus reuse outside the oil field? So I think it's I think it is important to identify gaps, very specific gaps that we have in these two bins: reuse inside the oil field and reuse outside the oil field. Well, what's what's 
really emerging to be pretty, I mean, I think it's pretty clear. One of the, the has anyone, let me ask that, has any group or has anyone put together in a body uh, of, you know, of information, all the research that has been done? Has anyone done that? Yeah, the, the Groundwater Protection Council report, which I think is in our- they did. They, Yeah, there's a 2019 and there's another report. Was an updated okay, yeah, okay. They, they do a pretty good job of what exists today. Okay. Um, and then the Nawi roadmap that Zahi alluded to, that kind of on the water quality toxicity that just identifies what research has been done and what gaps okay. are there. Okay. Well, and I, and I think, one of the things there is that we've got that kind of broad identification uh, of, of some of the research that's been done and some of the research gaps. But I do think that it's probably important for this consortium to identify um, and, and create a strategic result that identifies um, research and knowledge gaps specific to the work that we're doing here in the consortium, right? And so... Um, so whether that's compiling existing work that's been done and leading on consortium members here to be able to provide that information and compile that information so that we understand it, to identify the research gaps that are um, specific to Colorado and different basins in Colorado that may need to occur in order for us to be able to continue to make recommendations as a consortium. And then I think a really important piece, and this ties to the legislation, is this kind of this more, I guess, sociological identification of, um, well, maybe it's not sociological, but um, but just general identification of, of current state, right? So current state of infrastructure, current state of, of water um, use, uh, current state of reuse and recycling in different basins around the state, and then identification of, you know, needed states. And so that needed state being, you know, well, if this is current state and this is what we're able to accomplish from reuse and recycling at current state, what's the needed state that needs to happen in order for us to be able to uh, increase the amount of reuse and recycling that's occurring in different basins and, and you know, ultimately decrease the amount of fresh water that's being utilized. Um, and I think, I think the legislation has laid out that kind of reporting that is going to be necessary on that. But I think that also feeds into our decision making that um, that we're ultimately need to make. And I think the risk reward one is is really good. I think that's really important. Um, and uh, and identifying not over not only water quantity and quality, but uh, air quality as well as as we look at this. So go ahead, Barbara. Um, I'm just wondering if we want to eat this elephant one bite at a time and focus first, given the short time we have to do all of this work, fill those data gaps. If we want to focus first on reuse in the industry before we take that next step in terms of uh, water quality and um, research required to deal with use in ag or use for other purposes. So, so one comment about the process, thanks, Barbara. One comment about the process is that you can set different timelines for different results. <clears throat> so you could set uh, one timeline identifying the research gaps. You could set, uh, and that could be fairly close in, right? You could set another timeline, and however you articulate it, I'm just generalizing this, uh, getting the, the data about the current state, that could be, a similar or different timeline, and then getting to the needed state assessment could be yet a different timeline. So one of the things that you have available is how much by when, right? So you have the ability to set the pace of when something can be or needs to be accomplished by setting the dates when you have the result that you really want. So I understand I'm not directly uh, addressing the content of what you said, Barbara. I wanted to address the process for just a minute, but thank you. Marv, let me chime in on that. Tessa Sorensen. Um, I think there's two big prongs I'm hearing to reinforce what you've been saying, as well as what uh, Chair Mester and the rest of you have been saying for research. The first is identifying what gaps are there. 
Um, the second is identifying um, where there are not gaps, right? Um, and we're not talking about what research needs to be done in structuring research projects. We're talking about identifying those research projects and then at a later date, being able to set those up and schedule them possibly, or even make recommendations for others to be able to set them up through whatever process. That's why I'm hearing more intuitive than one or the other, uh, that, that, that those are two different things, right? Uh, Jacob Smith's online. Jacob, sorry, Jacob. First was Tom. Oh, I see. Thank you. I'm sorry, so am I going or am I waiting for somebody else? Go ahead, Jacob. I think you're the only one I see it with a hand up. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, those last three or four comments were really helpful at distilling the previous 15 minutes or whatever conversation. I had. So I won't reiterate any of those things, but to say I really like the last few comments and how we're breaking these pieces out. The two other thoughts, one is that it might be worth distinguishing between the where there are gaps in our shared collective knowledge in this group and externally facing with the parts of the public that care about this stuff, and then separately from where there are actual gaps in the research itself. That feels like it's helpful because on the latter one, we might be able to play a role in urging or encouraging the research entities themselves to add questions to their lists or to prioritize particular questions that we think are really important for the policy side that might not just on their own end up on the among the research community's priorities. So that feels like a if we distinguish that, we can maybe also have outcomes or results that are based on or focused on communicating, identifying and communicating what we think crucial forward looking research priorities might be. And the other thought is that it seems like there's a, we, it might be helpful to build in an iterativeness into how we're thinking about the research gaps. And partly that's captured by the idea of the, of different timelines for different priorities, which I really like, but also longer term where we might not know what some of the gaps are going to be that are going to be important to us later. So building in some mechanism for checking in with how have we, how have we filled in the gaps that we've identified? Does that, does that provoke identifying new gaps? Are there things that we thought we understood that now there's reasons to think we need to go back and revisit? So just some mechanism for treating this as an ongoing cycle of inquiry rather than a thing that we get done and check off. Jacob, thank you so much. Uh, I need to keep us moving. And I think the first part that you talked about, about equalizing the knowledge within the consortium is probably addressed in the education uh, strategic results. Thomas? Yeah, I just wanted to, to follow up on what Jacob said. I think there's a big communication gap between the research community and the public. The public, you know, keeps talking about subjects that the research community in many, many times have already addressed. So I think I agree that it would be good to communicate what we already know to identify, you know, real knowledge gaps, not uh, pursued uh, knowledge gaps. Thank you, Thomas. Again, I just refer you, you back is when you talk about communication, go back, look at the education strategic results that you already identified, because I think it's there. But I agree. Yeah. Clay, you're muted. Thank you for that. Uh, obviously, this is a huge area of need and concern, but in an effort to work toward uh, distilling things down uh, toward achievable, uh, measurable results um, relative to enhancing uh, the use of produced water in oil field applications, it might be it might be worth our while to to simply try and identify what research gaps exist that currently provide or create roadblocks, you know, to enhanced uh, or more uh, more use, user friendly use of produced water in in current oil field practices. So identifying, you know, focusing our efforts to identify what those research gaps are, rather than a, a broader group of things that obviously are important but relate to many different subjects. Thank you, Clay Tracy. Tracy, oh, I don't have any, I don't have anything to add. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Eric England. 
just referring back to the Colorado Priest Water Overview that Commissioner Messner provided, um, there's a list of dates that are associated with these research topics, March, July, August, September, as far as recommendations that this group will work on. And maybe that helps us inform the order of the priority of each of these data sets that we want to look at. Um, if I could make a, a suggestion that um, I think that what uh, Commissioner Messner offered is a structure we can work with. And I think you're probably talking about probably maybe three uh, specific stair step results around research that we could do. And I know that I'm going to articulate them incorrectly because <laughs> I don't know what you know. All right. Mm -hmm. But may I suggest that the first one is to uh, identify the research and data gaps that exist around produced water as it relates to the work of the consortium. Write that and respond to it um, as the first one. And then uh, the, the second was, and this goes to the assets, the comment that you made about assets. And that is to assess or at least document what the current state is regarding uh, uses, and, and I'm gonna say it wrong, uh, John, regarding uses and infrastructure that currently exist. So the current state, right? And that can, and, and, and uh, I'm saying this knowing that within each of these strategic results would be a variety of different topic areas, right? And I'm suggesting that at least if you need to, we can, if we need to identify what those major topic areas are, uh, we can do that. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes when you list the specific subparts of a result, you leave something out. And that's somewhat, that's sometimes a danger of listing you know, the subparts of a particular result, which you might miss something, right? Or discover something new. Yes, Irene. I would say current and future. So could we all let it just, just, sorry. Current no, and future. State. State. What Thank you're you. saying, so that we're designing for what's about to happen. To okay, you. that's that's excellent. Okay. Commissioner? No, I, I think you're right, Irene, um, except, uh, or and, I guess, um, I mean, I, I guess in my mind, the way that I'm picturing it is, you know, assess current state, assess needed state, and then develop future state, right? So like three three different things. And the, the idea behind that is that there's, uh, you know, there's an evaluation of current state, knowledge gaps, you know, better understanding, you know, and then the next step is, well, what do we need in order to be able to, um, you know, accomplish some of these um, deliverables or goals that the consortium may have. And then what do we, and the third one being, what do we, what do we envision the future state to be? And in order for us to get to the future state, you know, are we, are we still missing some research necessary in order to, you know, look out 10, 15 years, right? Um, so that's my thought at least. So it, it sounds to me like we're almost there. Um, I would add, I would modify that slightly and say that our job as this consortium is not to create the future state, but to enable it. Okay. Okay. All right. Interesting. So we're talking about um, one result about identifying the gaps in research and knowledge, correct? Then we're talking about uh, a stair step of uh, results around, around the state of things. What's the current state? What's the needed state? And then ultimately, what's the recommended future state? Is that correct? John, do we have that? Well, that's what I'm saying, but I want people to react to that. Well, I, so, I understand. Yeah. I understand. We're trying to get this down and, and give you something to respond to. So really talk, that's, uh, we also have, can we? It's on the screen. It's this first one. Okay. Yeah. Can I see this? Yes. Okay. So. <laughs> A little visual uh, clutter here. So we're talking about a result where you identify the research and data gaps that exist that are specific to the work of the, of the consortium. One, 
and then assess the current state and what what's involved in that john i think you i think you said infrastructure right yeah I, and and i and i think the current state a lot of that is is going to is going to dovetail pretty close with some of the deliverables in the legislation so Agreed. i mean as eric indicated Agreed. i mean we, we we've highlighted some of that right. i'm not sure that's all captured there to be honest with you i think mm -hmm. there's probably things that were missed yes um but uh, but current state could be infrastructure. Current state could be, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a amount of produced water that's being utilized generally. The amount of produced water that's being produced generally. The, I mean, some of the new reporting requirements that are associated with the legislation are certainly going to help develop some of that that knowledge uh, or that research to be able to, um, you know, to be able to analyze that and determine you know, kind of current state of, of water volume, water usage, amount of reuse and recycling. Um, you know, it could go as far as the, you know, amount of treatment that's actually occurring, the amount of storage. I mean, I'm, it, it, this could be really broad or I mean, we could narrow it down, right? But I think we have to understand current state, current state of transportation uh, of produced water, current state of, 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 of infrastructure, you know, the, those those, are Those types of things, you know, current state of, of air emissions associated with, you know, current current state. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm throwing too many things out here right now, but that'll give you an idea. Um, Thank you. Just wanting to highlight the interrelatedness between the knowledge gaps and this current state. So right. it may not be one, then the right. other. They're kind of concurrent. They're, they're almost parallel. In yeah. some ways. Right. I understand that, too. And then the second part of that would be to, to produce through research um, what the needed state is. Is that correct? Yeah. And then the third is, um, what's the difference between, John, the needed state and the future state or enabling it? So in, in my mind, the, the needed state is you know, identifying what... Um, you know, what are the things that need to happen in order for us to ultimately create the, I think, one of the intents of the consortium, which is to increase the amount of reuse and recycling of produced water, decrease the amount of fresh water, um, and and be able to set reuse and recycling targets in different basins around the state. And, you know, if if we are to do that, you know, what is what is the needed state that needs to happen? Do we have that state that we need right now in order to be able to accomplish that or if not what do we need to do in order to be able to accomplish that and then future state i think gets more aspirational okay. and so those type of research projects are you know as thomas was indicating you know what are the opportunities what are the research gaps what is the knowledge that we need to gain in order to be able to you know potentially use beneficially utilize water outside of the oil field produce water outside of the oil field in an agricultural setting in a in a in a you know a non potable in, industrial say you know I mean different but potential fit for use beneficial use type scenarios but I do think that some of those are more at least my understanding right now is they're a little more aspirational or a little further out than you know perhaps some of this other right. stuff. So so then John, um, this work would feed into probably some of the priority work that we're going to do on legislation, correct? the last piece so if you're identifying through research what the best future state or the mm -hmm. desired future state would be would that then feed into your results in legislation that we haven't done yet oh for that strategic priority yes well, i think all of them actually do well, well the current needed state and and future state certainly feed into it right okay. because i do think that you'll see that there's some you know legal barriers some regulatory barriers some policy barriers that may discourage the amount of reuse and recycling that that this consortium may want to develop understanding there's a risk reward as barbara said and i think that's important to acknowledge um, i also think that the future state can inform um, this consortium and and legislation identifying funding mechanisms and additional programs in order to be able to move some of that future state research forward so i want to ask a uh, because uh, you know we're uh Proactively is a nice word about the way we're facilitating right now. Um, so can I ask if we have consensus on this structure of four parts of the research uh, priority? One is about identifying the research gaps. 
two is identifying the current state, and that involves a lot of different topics. Three would be what if the needed state is, that would be a research uh, focus as well. And fourth, what would it take to enable, what would that future state look like? If that structure works for you, we'll take a quick break and write those out for you then to, to respond to. Do we have consensus that that structure of strategic results works within the party? Yes, Commissioner. Generally, yes, I agree. I had a I had a question on uh, collaboration with external partners and where that nests, because while we have okay. EPA at the table, while we have sure. um, universities at the table, we have organiz you know industry at the table who all may have access to research that answers many of these questions. Um, is collaboration with external partners uh, assumed, or do we need to be explicit about it to achieve these goals? John, would you like to respond to that, please? Uh, I think that's a great point. And I do think we need to be explicit. And I do think there's a piece in the legislation that um, that talks about um, us making recommendations on how it, state and federal agencies can better you know, communicate and cooperate with one another. And I think that ties well into what you say. And so uh, I would make it explicit. And I will, I will try to be more brief in my statement. Thank you, Commissioner. And we'll, we'll include that in you know, collaborating with our partners. Uh, and that language will go in there. Yes, Barbara, one more comment. No, I'm just going to be redundant. Uh, this could be um, a 10-year project if we don't have focus. And so my question is, do we want to add a uh, <clears throat> layers in here for reuse within the oil and gas industry and then at a later date pick up the challenge for oil and gas uh, i mean produce water reuse outside of the oil and gas industry I, so I my can't question answer. to the group i can't answer that yeah uh, zahi can't um yeah yes i'm I, you have to prioritize things i i think but i'm i'm going back to what eric said about the the research gaps and the current state and the needed state. I don't know how you figure out the gap if you don't know what's the state and the needed state. I think the gap is number more number three after you know what you want, what you have and what you want. So that's a logical research model. Yeah. So I'm gonna ask again, thank you for those those last comments. Do we have consensus on the consortium? to use these four specific results that we will write out for you as the strategic results within the research priority. Do we have consensus? Okay, so what it, we'd like to ask you to do is step away for 10 minutes. We'll, we'll write these up, we'll come back and, and remarkably finish the, the research priority. In an hour and 15 minutes, even. Um, so 10.15, folks, thank you. Uh, bagels, coffee, snacks. Catch up with Hope if you need to sign stuff. All right, we're uh, back. Colorado Peace Water Consortium. We took a 15, 10-minute break. Uh, back to you, Marvin Darcy. Thanks, everyone. Please come together. We've drafted the strategic results uh, for research. And remember, because of our timeline, we're not gonna be doing a lot of, uh, we don't have time for a lot of wordsmithing. We need to get right to it and let us share with you what we've come up with. So the first strategic result is by X state working collaboratively, oop, if I could say it right, working collaboratively with our partners, identify the research and data gaps specific to the work of the CPCW. Okay. How's that, everybody? Pretty clear? Yeah. All right. Then we get into the state, right? And there's a couple of choices here. Uh, again, by X state, working collaboratively, thank you, Commissioner, for that, with our partners, assess and report on the current state of produced water within the basins of Colorado. Now, uh, Darcy and I did a little work, uh, we were a little bit too specific here like the current state of volume, uses, infrastructure, and impact. And uh, Commissioner uh, Messner said, we really don't need that to be that specific. And I sort of violated my own guidance is sometimes if you list things, you'll leave something out, right? 
So this one would read by X state working collaboratively with our partners, assess and report on the current state of produced water within the basins of Colorado. Does that sound like a good uh, result? Okay. Uh, next, uh, by x working collaboratively with our partners, identify the needed state of produced water within the basins of Colorado. Yes, sir. The, the term partners, we, how broad or narrow is partners? That will be up to you. And, and, and Eric, just so you know, like in, in the next stage, in, in some of the actions in the implementation plan, you know, as 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 you start to layer this and you start in the implementation plan, starting to identify actions that need to occur in order to be able to meet that that um, that result, you'll be specific with which partners need to be involved with which action item. Right. And so on one action item, you may have like the needed state may be to you know increase the amount of of uh produced water uh take away from existing oil and gas locations so partners in that could be you know PUC midstream operators uh you know um industry operators you know local governments i mean i don't know i'm making stuff up right now but these could be the partners to that would be identified in that action that's a much better answer than it's up to you <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's see. So, and then the the fourth. Oh, you didn't do that, right? Yeah. So, by X state working collaboratively with our partners, identify the needed state of produced water within uh, Colorado, the basins of Colorado. Okay. Yeah. And then, lastly, again, working with your your partners. <laughs> By, by X state, working collaboratively with your partner, with our partners, articulate the aspirational and feasible future state of produced water in the basins of Colorado. Say that one again. Sure. By X state, working collaboratively with our partners, articulate the aspirational and feasible future state of produced water in the basins of Colorado. So the word feasible makes me twitch, just yeah. so you know. Let's take uh, it out then. All right. Uh, I really hate to see you twitch. Right. <laughs> I get nervous when you're, when you're twitching. Because right. uh, I mean, it is aspirational, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, I think feasible and reasonable have to come into the conversation, but I don't know as I want to see it okay. as, a, as, a, as a result, so. Okay. Um, I want to cleaner. Okay. Yes. And we had one more clarifying that Amber put in there, which is uh, specifying that these are oil and gas basins, not water basins. Just for clarity, that was that was a good catch. Do we need to? Do we need to say that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We will add that. Doug? What do we mean by future state? If if I read that, I'm not sure what that would mean. Okay. Irene Andrus, what I meant when I had said future is don't just plan for where things are today. Make sure that you're considering what's going to be tomorrow. Well, and, so it's and, scalable. And Doug, for me, what that means is, um, you know, that that's aspirational 10, 15, 20 years down the road. What research actually needs to happen in order for us to, you know, have we identified, you know, a, a new water source that can be beneficially utilized for a number of different um, for a number of different uses? Have we, you know, identified, you know, alternative technologies uh, that that may be available that would significantly re reuse the amount of fresh water that's being utilized. And so could we replace state with use? I mean, yeah, use utilization. Use Maybe I agree. Excellent. <clears throat>
Thank you. Do you want to have both? Because we use the word state down here. We use this, the word state in the other person. And, and and just just so you understand my perspective on that when I when I utilize the word state is that certainly use could be part of it, but it may also be you know a future state of you know a regulatory landscape, a future state of technology, a future state of infrastructure, a future state of you know I don't know as I want to limit it specifically to use because I think we could be aspirational that if you know. Because some of this potentially applies to other energy technologies beyond oil and gas in the future. And so whether that's geothermal, whether that's, um, you know, other things, what are what are some of the future states that we need in order to be able to ensure that we're able to reuse and re recycle, produce water in, in, in those instances? You know what I mean? Um, Do you want to stay with state or utilization? I, I'm okay either way, to be honest with you. So I'm not trying to like step on anything, but I just wanted folks to understand why I was using the word state. I like the general term because it also addresses water law issues that uh, can be very sticky. Um, but I'd also like to go back to Zahi's comment that the gaps really come after steps one and what you have as steps two and three, if those are in order. So what we would suggest to you is that not today, but very shortly, you'll adjust, you'll set the dates for these so you can stair step those in terms of the sequence. And I suspect that that's going to be a pretty robust conversation. Okay. Yes. Jolie Bronner, I just want to make a note that I have a feeling we're going to be starting almost every section's roles with working collaboratively with our partners is there a way we can just loop that into everything we do is that not allowed it's quite allowed okay <laughs> we, we actually you might actually put that in a, a preamble statement about about you know the plan itself i just thought like we want to work with educational partners we want to work with community partners we want to work with research partners and we're just going to keep coming up right on that. yeah we would probably suggest that it maybe come in a preamble statement uh, yes. Regarding the, the plan itself, and if if that happens, obviously we can you know, take it out of each individual strategic result and save some money. Excellent. So, so probably the same on, on the same note. Also, put an asterisk next to state and define what are things that can constitute we states. Can absolutely do that. And basins. And basins. Mm -hmm. Right. We can find well, that would really help us. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Amber. Amber, thank you very much. <laughs> There's a whisper campaign going on. <laughs> very nice. Okay, everyone. Um, all right. So, uh, has, Sorry. oh, I see. She's making notes about when he's going to the preamble. Thank you very much. So, what I'd like to do now is to shift our, thank you. Darcy. What I'd like to do now is shift uh, to uh, the next priority, which is communities and environment. Let's just take that pause. And we'll start the same kind of conversation about why is that a priority? Why is communities and environment a priority? Everyone? Protection. <laughs> to say it succinctly, protection. Protection. We can't drink oil and gas. <laughs> awesome. Dang, I love it. <laughs> Positive impact. <laughs> okay, so impacts, yeah. okay. Avoiding historical negative impacts. Avoiding. Historical Not repeating past mistakes. Avoiding historical negative impacts. Yes. Irene Andrus, when you consider the environment and people up front as stakeholders, then you avoid externalities down the road and businesses can understand the true cost 
of what it's going to cost to bring, for example, this well onto the market, and they can factor it in in their decision making about whether or not this is a viable um, economic um, venture. Okay, thank you. Jolie Bronner, intentional inclusion and accessibility. I think we got Clay Terry online. Yes, thanks. This is Clay. Uh, it probably goes without saying, but we're all in this together. And so uh, the, our communities and even our stewardship or the environment need to have agency in what we're doing and, and, and what we're considering so that so that it's implementable and, of course, sustainable. OK, let us catch up for just a second, please. Sorry. Tracy? I don't have anything. Are you seeing my hand up or something? No, he just keeps calling on you. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> no, you just keep turning on. I'm just taking you in the order in which you. you uh, Thomas? Well, I can say something. Yeah, okay. Um, so I think the communities and environment, you know, those should be the um, stakeholders, if you want, that we should keep in mind when we design and develop water treatment technologies, because we want to make sure that we treat the water enough to protect the communities in our environment. We don't want to over treat so it becomes economically unfeasible. So anything we target with respect to treatment and reuse should be focused on protecting the communities and environment. I think that's that's super, super important, right? Okay. Thank you, Thomas, for your spur of the moment comment. Thank you. Uh, Tessa Sorensen, add to that, we've talked a lot about reuse and recycling. We need to be careful not to ignore proper disposal okay. because there will be times that we will find in any of our research and work that we find that there are times you cannot recycle or reuse something and whatever's left that cannot be has to be disposed of in a way that still protects the community's environment. Thank you, Tessa. Yes, Commissioner. Um, I, I agree with the, the the list so far. And for me, the, the reason that's important is because the costs remain with us, whether or not they are explicitly tied to the cost of producing the water. Because if health disparities go down or land values go down, as a community, we still have to pay those costs. That's really insightful. Yes, sorry. You're too close. Uh, John Heyer, I would just add uh, the effects of infrastructure and uh, on the communities and the environment and how, you know, having additional pipelines for reusing and recycling produced water and how that could affect the environment and communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, on, on this one, I think from from my standpoint, I mean, you've got the the community piece, and I think uh, intentional engagement is a is a really powerful term in that. And and I think that when you start talking about the communities and some of the things that we'll be contemplating, uh, particularly around infrastructure, storage, transportation, disposal, treatment of produced water, you know, these are these are um, these are concepts that are gonna have impacts associated with them. And so making sure that we're intentionally engaging communities, local governments, areas in which these are, are being contemplated, we evaluate it for risk reward, we evaluate it um, you know, uh, to, to ensure that, that what we're proposing is you know, appropriate uh, from a cumulative impact standpoint. Um, and so I think these things are all really an important piece of this. And so. Very good, Jess, Ember. Ember, Michael, may we also please include some of the benefits, maybe some of the economic benefits that would pertain to the communities in regarding produced water and reuse and recycling and the environment as well. There's some benefits. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Thanks. Yes. 
Jolie Bronner, I just want to elevate something you mumbled when she said that is accessibility and these jobs that are going to be created. What is the credentialing pathway for these? How are these accessible? How are we making these in community where people can get these jobs and how are we communicating that value? Very good. Thank you. Yes, Barbara. Yeah, as we're talking about communities and we're thinking about front range ozone non-attainment when we're looking at air quality impacts, I just want to toss out here, I hope we will advise uh, rulemaking that is the same across the state in the rural areas of Colorado as well as the urban areas. We all breathe the same air. Right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, protection impacts, avoiding historical uh, negative impacts, understand true costs for impacts, uh, intentional inclusion, accessibility, all in this together, economically feasible, reuse, recycle, and proper disposal. Um, costs remain with use. We still pay for it in the community, even if they're not assessed originally. Infrastructure impacts on communities, intentional engagement, um, evaluate risk and reward, economic benefits in communities, environmental benefits, accessible benefits such as jobs, uh, and advise rulemaking across the state. Sorry, this is small. I'll try to write bigger. Yes, Emma. May we, Ember Michael, uh, may we also please on that very last bullet point carve out that the Southern New Indian tribe has their own authority over the airshed? in collaboration with the state of Colorado and the Environmental Commission. Thank Hold you. That. Just a second, Commissioner, we'll catch up. You try. Yeah. As their own. Independence. As their own. As so. Thank you. And Southern. 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 Thank you, everyone. Appreciate that. Okay. And independence. Commissioner? Yes, uh, I think it's a good call out to include the tribal nations that are present in the state of Colorado. If we're naming government authorities, there tends to be, as a county commissioner, I have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder because frequently when it says local government, it usually means cities. And I would like to be a little more explicit about the communities of engagement to include counties and cities and um, areas of impact, particularly because our counties have our public health authority. Okay. So areas of impact uh, are beyond you have a only city. What's that? You have a few ways in my hand. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Who online wants to speak? How about Cloel? <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I have a question about um, the term disposal. Just sort of, and this is something that's always been really confusing to me. Um, I have seen the use, of <laughs> the word disposal used in a way that um, I wouldn't necessarily think about it, like disposal by land application. Um, sometimes it, I just want to make sure that we have a, a good working definition of disposal <laughs> nice. in this context. Thanks, Cora. Yeah. Okay. I got it. You do. Thomas? Okay. I don't know, maybe it was already said, but I think it's important that we um, address the value added to communities and the environment when we reuse, treat, treat and, and reuse produced water. We live in a, in, a, in a state with severe water scarcity. And one of the things I'm working a lot on is trying to make sure that we all have water enough. So, you know, properly treated water can add a lot of value to communities and environment, and that should definitely be a focus. Thank you. Clay, did you have something? You're muted, Clay. Clay, you're Sorry, trying to keep my coughing down so you don't <laughs> notice that. Um, <clears throat> as we consider the continued likely development, land development, uh, communities development, uh, et cetera, in Colorado going forward, in, including the, our communities and, and considering our environment, uh, at, at a minimum will help provide more informed development um, with respect to understanding about oil and gas, with respect to the use of reuse of produced water 
uh, as it may pertain to the continued development uh, in specific communities or geographic areas. A really good comment, Tessa. Uh, Tessa Sorensen, that's a wonderful lead into the comment I was going to make, which is direct um, contribution to the affected communities. Because a lot of times we see justification of things such as, well, it's being offset by this effort, which is beneficial, but it's not beneficial to the people that were harmed in the production of that particular asset. Okay, direct impacts on Thank you very much. Yeah. But, but, you. And but maybe also to include, you know, limit development or when you already have industry there because you know even if you try to be environmentally um aware you know it's 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 not a safe you know industry so try to limit the development in these areas it can go in many different directions yeah it might be to limit it might be to expand yeah or change development Jacob yeah, I want to echo what Tessa said, and and I think just name specifically that one of the regulatory maneuvers or management maneuvers we sometimes run into is versions of of like cap and trade as a general category, and that's one place where we see those impacts. Particularly, there are higher risks to the vulnerable communities where the entities that are managing their disposal can shift things around among multiple sites. And it often ends up being the most vulnerable communities that get the, get, get the burden, even if the net of the burden is minimized. So just making sure that we're being particularly attentive to the ways in which vulnerable communities often get shorted in, these, in this kind of process. Thank you, Jacob. Tracy, did you have anything? <laughs> no, but thanks for considering All right. me. All right, we'll keep calling you. <laughs> yes. Uh, just kind of a restatement at a high level for, as I consider it is that the goal of this effort is to reduce produced water and to increase, or, or I'm sorry, to reduce the use of fresh water, increase the use of produced water, but it's not at all cost. It is with a collaborative effort for the positive benefit of everyone around it. And I know that's... Uh, all of these details that have been mentioned are what's associated with that, but it's really understanding that there are trade-offs, but we want to make sure that we value the community and the environment that we're trying to make those decisions. In. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point because I do think that the, you know, the ultimate goal here, the reason that the consortium was developed was to, you know, figure out opportunities to reducing fresh water in, um, oil and gas activities you know, and, and increasing the amount of reuse and recycling and exploring other beneficial uses of, of perhaps a, a new water source, you know, in some future state. And so um, to me, that, that, that is important. And that's really a benefit, you know, I mean, that, that's benefit to reduce freshwater use, no matter whether it's lawn and garden stuff or whether it's, you know, an oil and gas activity. So. Thank you. Yes, I think this might be a good, oh, Michalina Pollack, um, to talk about uh, maybe the standardizations during the environment, toxicology, standardization. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, everyone, I'm going to call time out, time in. Uh, this has been a very, very good discussion. Um, and do you need do you need for us to to reread these or review these again? You okay? Okay. So one of the things that I think we really have heard a lot about is to assess the impact on communities. And I know we talked about you know what the the knowledge gaps were in research but is there some role that the commission has in either prompting guiding or leading in terms of the assessment the current assessment or assessment of the current impacts on communities do we know that i mean i I think that's I think that's 
hard, but I'm not saying that we shouldn't or it's not yeah. impossible, but I think that's hard. I think we understand. I think that evaluation can occur, you know, as we look at current state and as we look at the particular situations, um, you know, I think we've got broad understandings of, you know, um, air emissions associated with, uh, you know, oil and gas activities. And we've got broad understanding of water use, but um, w whether or not there, there's that granular information of uh, that that produced water specifically is impacting or not impacting, disproportionately impacted communities, for example. I don't know as that information is available. Okay. All right. Yes. Trish. Trish with EPA. I know we have EJ mapping tools. Has anybody looked at where the large portion of oil and gas activity is happening with respect to EJ communities in Colorado. The hands are going up. Okay. <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll let local answer first, then CDPH. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Emma Pinto, Adams County Commissioner. It is happening in Adams County. <laughs> well, Tessa Sorensen, it, it's happening statewide. Um, there have been statutory definitions of disproportionately impacted communities that have been created now. They went into effect in May. Um, there's a lot of work at CDPHE being done identifying exactly which communities are being impacted by what. Um, they are limited by census block group. And that is important to note because the area of those groups can vary wildly. I personally live in one that's less than square mile. There's also one that's the eastern half of Garfield County. So it, it's that's something that is, yes, we are. How granular it is depends upon population centers. And so... That's that's a limitation. But let, let me let me ask you a little bit about that because, as it applies to us, does that do, is that analysis looking at, I guess, produced water specifically? Is that is that analysis looking at oil and gas generally, or is it this is where treatment facilities are? This is where produced water storage is. You know that that level of detail. Yes and no. Um, not necessarily in that tool in terms of proximity to oil and gas. Yes. In terms of produced water impacts, no. In terms of water scarcity, yes, but not in the same place. Um, we live in a state where 80% of the water falls on the west and 80% of the people fall, live in the east. In fact, we have one of the longest water tunnels in the world going underneath the Continental Divide for that reason. Um, so that that's worth noting is there are experts on that that have looked at that, but not from a produced water lens, unless the EPA has it. <laughs> And then, so I just kind of have a follow-up to that. Sorry if I touched a nerve, but um, so you've got uh, a large amount of production that's happening in these EJ communities. And then I guess my other question would be, what's their drinking water source? Are they using groundwater? Are they on private domestic wells, groundwater wells? The, right, the vast majority of the people on this side of the Front Range um, in the populated Denver Metro, North Denver area, are actually drinking snow melt water that is treated. Um, that's where almost all of it comes from. Aquifer sources, as well as tributary canals and ditches off of the South Platte and things like that. So the um, snow melt are used a lot in ag. Right. They're also utilized to do hydraulic fracturing in oil and gas wells. Okay. So yes, much. Yeah, just to follow up, I, I think one of the things that's interesting is that the water districts and the sewer districts are um, varied. And so for in my community where we have 550,000 people, 1,000 square miles, 80% um, of my population would be considered disproportionately impacted. We are one of two minority majority communities in the state and the only large county that is a minority majority. We have so many, I think at last count, about 24 different water districts serving everyone and they have a variety of water sources. Sources. There's ag that has wells, uh, you know, city of Westminster primarily gets water through Clear Creek, you know, there's the Prairie Waters Project out in Aurora, the, the uses are varied, um, and they um, have different levels of financing depending on the size of their district and sophistication for their own ability to monitor their water. The well water is monitored by the local health department, but that is by um, well owner request, not mandate. And so there's, there's a lot of different uh, push and pull. And it's something that has been in the back of my mind that I don't know it's within the scope of this 
gathering to have conversations about how water and water health uh, for drinking water is regulated within the state of Colorado, but it is something that is done, unfortunately, in a patchwork fashion. And Tessa Sorensen, and I'm going to let Ember jump in here if I need to. I know I'll put you on the spot. Um, it might be worth listing out in our discussions of communities environment, the um, separation between tributary and non-tributary waters. Um, for, for those who don't know what that means, tributary waters tend to be anything you see on a river up on the surface or connected to the surface, which also means shallow aquifers. Those do not tend to be affected by oil and gas operations if, with the exception of being utilized instead of re reused water, produced water. Uh, Eric Anglin, I appreciate, Commissioner, what you mentioned. It uh, triggered in my mind just the opportunities, not only working maybe what you think of communities as the people in it, but even in the municipalities, the, the sewer districts, where they may also be working to treat new standards. There could be some great partnerships to work together to try to meet um, new regulations, um, financing those kind of projects together because of that. I, I, I greatly appreciate that. I think also... Again, like I raised the question of like how much this fits with our scope, but it's certainly the environment that we're working in. There's new federal dollars as well. Um, and certainly some of our water districts and sewer districts have been applying for federal assistance to modernize their practices and make more water available. Um, additionally, we are still in the process of remediation for we have the largest collection of um, orphan wells in the state of Colorado by far, at this point, a little over 300. And we got a presentation this week on some of them that include unlined, uncovered pits um, where water and funk, you know, as a non-scientist um, has been deposited and collecting. And because they're unlined, uncovered, we now have a lot of questions about water table um, in that area. Okay. All right, so given all the things that you've identified in this recent, very robust conversation, uh, what sounds like a result that the consortium would want to accomplish in regard to community? Can I repeat that? What result would the consortium want to be able to achieve as it relates to communities and produce water. Uh, Jolie Bronner, goals for community itself would be to inform them, educate them, and include them in the process. So there's understanding of what's happening in their community. Did, and we talked about this, remember, Julie, when we were doing the education priority? Yes. Uh, you want me to leave that in education? I can. That's okay. Well, it's really a question, <laughs> right? So, so we, you know, we talked about, you know, really educating and engaging communities, right? A lot. Yeah. Um, I mean, we could, we could even move one of those over here. Let's, wanted... let's not get crazy. Let's let some of the other hands go first. Okay. That's, yeah, we'll, All that's right. good. All right. Yes, Irene. Okay. Proposals, please. Irene Andrus. So, um, and this is kind of a question as well uh, to the commissioners, actually. So if what we did was know upfront what the true cost is for the disposal of water and whatnot, and if that is included in the permitting process, would that enable the commissioners to make a decision at that point about whether or not to allow the permitting of this well considering what all of the costs are associated with it and figuring out oil would have to be selling for this much a, a barrel for this really to be a viable enterprise. I I'm asking. Uh, short, short answer is no. <clears throat> yeah. So ec economic viability, feasibility, um, or even technical feasibility, to be honest with you, are not considerations in the regulatory regime of ECMC on either side. Yeah. That would be a suggested result then is that it's considered in the permitting process okay. as to whether or not to Let, proceed. That's going to need to go in legislative, in legislative. piece. Okay. Yeah. But uh, Irene, thank you for that. You just gave us, um, you know, one of the next ones. So thank, <laughs> thank you very much. 
Barbara? Oh, I'm sorry. Hello? Hi, yeah, thanks. Uh, we've moved on, <laughs> so I'm not sure um, who said this. Somebody said something about standardized standardization, and I, I just wanted to get a little clarity on what that meant. It was in regards to, I mean, I think it probably should have been under research, but we okay. should be looking at um, standardization of toxology, what would be appropriate for certain uses. I mean, a lot of this is already in research, but I think it should be listed out for the standardization. Okay. I agree. Um, it, it could be in research, but if we're talking about environment and community, it could easily fit in there as well. Um, may I uh, push a little harder to put that into research, meaning because we don't have enough information to set standards? Um, I think that's a, that's a future I can't remember which, which of the four it is, but it's definitely a future state. We need a lot more data to be able to start informing policy decisions like standards. That could be in, that could be put in an action item under future state or even uh, needed state. So everybody, uh, we're still discussing. Hang on just a second, if you will, Michelle. Everybody, we really need proposals for specific strategic results to be accomplished in regard to communities and research. Kevin? Um, I would like to propose that we identify the communities that are being impacted by oil and gas today because that's where all the produced water will be coming from. And then how can we minimize um, further harm via these industrial um, operations to those communities? Trisha. And thanks, Kevin. This is Trisha from EPA. I was going to say the same thing. Basically, I think rural areas where you have EJ and EJ communities and particularly areas that are relying on groundwater, understanding if there's impacts that are happening from water withdrawals and those water withdrawals are turning into waste on the back end. So I would second Kevin. Thank you, Doug. Um, I would take the other side of that coin. We also need to point out the benefits to the community. Um, you know, jobs, revenues, severance taxes, yeah. um, also the implementation of the infrastructure to create the groundwater availability that would be replaced by produced water reuse. Um, we make sure the communities understand that what the industry has done to create those benefits of bringing that water to the surface of which they can continue to use to either grow their community or for the positive okay. their community. I'm going to get to everybody, but let's let's make sure we got what we got. So. We are talking about identifying communities that are being impacted today, uh, including evaluating the impacts of withdrawing water, groundwater, correct? That's one. And the second is to, um, we're just using common language here just sure. for a second, Doug, and that is pointing out the benefits of produced water. Are you talking about individual communities? I think, John, you said that's kind of difficult to do. No, just in general, I mean, we could take it across yeah. the state, right? The the, the okay. development of the an investment in the infrastructure on the fresh water side of extraction is great. Um, and it's happened for decades. Um, so we, we would want to also educate them on that. Hey, we can recycle and reuse the produced water. The benefit of that is then to utilize that infrastructure to to continue to provide the the fresh water to the community. Thanks, right, sir. we can't, we can't, we can't do this without uh, focusing on the that side of the coin as well. Sure, it'll be unfair to the community. Thank you, Joel. Jolie Bronner, I just wanted to suggest a resource and or possible definition. The EJ Task Force, when they released their recommendations, their entire section four is their definition of disproportionately impacted community and goes through how we define those in several pages. So, as a resource that exists. I would like to suggest that we use the recommendations of the EJ task force sure. to help identify where our mm -hmm. um, definition of disproportionately impacted communities are. For the first one. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah, I just, we were getting ahead. So I just. Well, that's, that's I, th I think that the, um, I'll make sure I'm understanding. So, I mean, I think, I think that we, we do have tools available to us to understand cumulatively impacted communities, disproportionately impacted communities, 
uh, whether that's Enviro Screen or the different definitions that were developed by the Environmental Justice Task Force. I guess where I'm struggling a little bit is do should we be more specific about identifying communities that are potentially impacted with activities associated with produced water or whether it should more broadly just identify cumulatively cumulatively impacted or disproportionately impacted communities because i know our recommendation authorities are going to ally very specifically with produced water um, what do you i mean that's a really critical sort of a, um, a tipping point in terms of the conversation john what do you recommend well, I mean, for a result, I think I think identifying which, and and again, this is this is this is already known. You know, disproportionately impacted communities or cumulatively impacted communities or utilizing EnviroScreen. I mean, this is known, so we can identify those, and there's some correlation between, um, you know, potential impacts associated with produced water and current oil and gas activity. So that's kind of a known thing, but at the same time. I think as we're starting to contemplate some of these things, like we're going to need additional infrastructure if we want to reuse and recycle. We're going to do a risk reward analysis on whether or not we should develop 75 miles of new pipeline and, you know, 1.5 million barrels of produced water storage um, and five new treatment facilities in order to be able to hit a recycling target of 20% in the DJ basin. Um, and I'm, I'm making these numbers up. Uh, the, uh, you know, how do we engage and determine, you know, and develop recommendation in communities that potentially already have cumulative impacts issues? Uh, how do we identify the risk reward associated with where that infrastructure should go, how that infrastructure would go? And is there, you know, a green light, red light type of scenario that we can recommend, you know, as to the the benefit of reuse and recycling in this particular area and the necessary infrastructure that needs to go into it is not worth the additional emissions or potential impact to these cumulative impacted communities to be able to do it. Understanding that in the legislation itself, it already says that no new facilities can happen in disproportionately impacted communities, which actually is 80% of the state. Thank you, John. I think it's actually possible Thomas had his hand up before I did. Okay. If we want to handle that. So I think one of the things we need to, to address is life cycle analysis, right? Um, that's actually a research, you know, um, area. And if you, if you think about life cycle analysis from the perspective of beneficial reuse of produced water, that would take into account the economics, the human health risk, the carbon footprint, you know, and, and all of the different costs. And by having a really good life cycle analysis model, you can basically put in all the different numbers and then evaluate an overall, whether it is an overall benefit or not. So I think that would be really, really beneficial. And it would allow us to address regional differences um, going forward. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I think what, what I think the way that can be handled is that life cycle analysis can be part of the research uh, mm -hmm. aspect that will be done. Tessa? Yeah, Tessa, Tessa starts. I think I'm going to distill what I've been hearing over the past like seven comments. I think we need to, as a result, be able to provide a set of guidelines um, to identify communities that are either or impacted or could benefit from produced water recycling or reuse basically a way to find the place that could you could use it because we're not going to find them all as a consortium all the ones impacted we're not going to find all the ones that could benefit but if we can find the how do you find them then we will have done something very powerful so tessa help us with the language um develop uh, a framework uh to identify uh, uh impacted um communities or communities that could potentially be benefited. We could add disproportionate in there if we needed to as well. Yeah, disproportionately impacted communities for sure. And the benefit. Okay, thank you very much. 
Ember Michael, listening to everyone, this may be outside of the box, but wondering if for communities, can we promote and foster communication for um, some of the stuff that's outlined within the legislature with water infrastructure, storage and treatment facilities? And can we, um, instead of working as a segmented state, kind of maybe more work together and see like where within the state would a treatment facility make sense or where, and maybe that's a part of the LCA that um, Thomas was just talking about, but what really, uh, uh, thank you, life cycle analysis, um, but really start thinking of the state as a whole, as opposed to just like, in granted, all of our basins are different and there's lots of differences, but maybe we could spin the story a little bit and see how we could um, work together to reduce the, the use of fresh water through recycling and reuse, but together. Right. And like, where are some of the areas in the state that could benefit and work together, whether it's a pipeline from A to B or a storage facility or a treatment facility over here that we could build a pipeline to mitigate future impacts later, but really kind of come up with a big, or I know big sounds work, <laughs> but like a strategy, right. And start like building that as opposed of um, just treating everybody independently. I don't, it's help big us, task. Help but. us articulate what that result is, please. The result is going to be, I, I, I'm looking up at the board, but like the communities and environment. So I think that everybody would um, benefit in having one larger infrastructure. And please chime in if anybody else agrees with me here. I'm kind of on the spot, but um, I think the result would just be. Um, a more continuous life cycle of produced water and then fresh water usage as a whole, maybe. Um, and then being able to have, if you have recycling or reuse and be able to share that commodity within the state. The, the knowledge is on the fly thinking right here. <laughs> That's in right. the state. A state level life cycle analysis, does that exist? Or I don't know. No. So I, I, I think what I hear you saying, and I think to develop it into a potential result would be to because I think a lot of what we're talking about evaluates as asking us to evaluate on a basin by basin uh piece. But there's also opportunities to look at this, you know, statewide. And so um so the result could be to, you know, by this date, um, I, I, this is not an easy one. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, a statewide collaboration on um, reuse and recycling of produced water, you know, you know, interconnected, the, the inter, interconnecting the basins, maybe, or or in 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 trust state or something like that. So, so I mean, this this is really this is really important, right? So you're really talking about statewide interbasin strategies for the use, recycling, and disposal of produced water. Is that correct? Yes. It, Yes, and I think what we're looking at is identifying points of imbalance, right? Yeah. There's there's places that are producing a lot of produced water, and that produced water is maybe fairly clean or easy to treat, but the people that are surrounding it are not the people that need that, potentially. Um, maybe they need drinking water, and they have, but they don't have... Um, they have a lot of agricultural source water, but they don't have a lot of drinking water, or vice versa. Um, you know, identifying where those imbalances are and, and trying to connect source A to need B. Right. And I don't think we need to, right. And I don't think we need to identify them all. We need to identify how to make the map. Yeah. Say so the last part. We need to be able to show how to make that map. Make that. Not be writing it all the time. Yes. Yeah, uh, I think perhaps we need a high level goal and result, and that is reducing the use of fresh water and increasing the use of recycled water in the oil and gas industry. And from that, 
adding uh, without impact to environment and community. And then we get into parsing the details that you all have been commenting on in the last uh, 20 minutes. I'd change that to minimize, not without. Uh, I, I Zero impact is not a concept I, I, I tend to. I, I know, <laughs> I, I'm pushing the envelope. <laughs> Let's not forget impact is positive as well, yeah, not only negative. We can't live in the negative. I, I'm not in the negative, but I'm trying to um, have an aspirational goal. But so you can modify that language if you'd like. And I know two of you have your hand up. I, please just hold, <clears throat> pause and hold that. So, John, I think you're really talking about putting the purpose of the consortium into a strategic result. I think that's right. I mean, I think that I think that that makes sense because I think a, a lot of the things that we're we're kind of getting off into rabbit holes here about, which are all important, end up being actions, uh, you know, yeah. uh, uh, or uh, strategies, and so um, and so. I think that that does ultimately capture. I think what Ember's talking about. I think it's talk captures what some of Bar what Barbara's talking about. But you know, to you know, by blah blah blah, reduce the you know, use of fresh water um, and increase the amount of reuse and recycling, um, you know, both, and I don't know how to capture this in language, but both, you know, you know, inter-basin and intrastate, I think. Um, but, uh, and then I think we build some things into that. Um, I, I do think that we need to be a little bit careful here because I think we're stepping away from the original intent of the priority of community and environment here. So we are we are we are going into some wormholes here right now, and I think the intent of the community and the environment was to ensure that as we are making some of the decisions in this, that we are um, engaging communities, that we're listening to communities, that we're evaluating um, the community needs, that we're partnering with communities. You know, in and, and and making sure that they're forefront in the conversation as we're uh, making some of these decisions and recommendations as part of the legislation. And I think the same can be said for environment. And so, um, and so, I just want us to make sure that we understand what the priorities are. It's not a debate about right. you know what rabbit hole we want to go down today. We'll have those arguments, but it's not today. Um, Jennifer, um, so would rest, Jennifer, would rest the existing or future problems? Jennifer, could you take us back to the list of results? I didn't understand this question. So, so if, if there are savvy, if you don't mind. So, so if there are existing or future problems associated with produced water and communities and environment. Are they looking at us to solve these problems, or are there are there mechanisms to solve problems? They're they're looking to us to develop the structure and um, the recommendations around how that could be um, evaluated and addressed. So, okay. so, so probably one of the objective can be you know to create a toolbox to you know with you know objectives and solution to identify problems and solve them. So, okay. Historical problems that we're trying to existing problem. You know, community has a problem or environment has a problem. You know, how do we approach solving this problem? From a produced water standpoint. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah, our yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we're not solving yeah. everything. Solve all the problems. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Right Associated with produced right. water. I wanted to add on to what Doug said about community benefits and that also to see the full picture to talk about the benefits to shareholders and the profits of the company as well to show that full picture. And I just want to point out in New Jersey, who just passed cumulative impacts rules, um, economic benefits cannot be a benefit for the community and public interest. Um, and really looking at what true, um, what benefits would look like outside of that. And so just 
planting that seed here. And then the other thing I want to mention is I think that we should really be mindful of what layered benefits and possible funding opportunities there could be. I hear things that the state needs statewide fiber optics and e-bike trails and light rails and other infrastructure. And so there's funding opportunities. And for an example, in the city of Denver, we've just approved funding for sidewalks and bike lanes. But if you try to put bike lanes in a place where there's no sidewalks, that doesn't make sense. Or when you do one and you lay that project down and realize three years later, we're going to tear that all up to put in these bike lanes and redo it all again. We really need to look at the full what else could possibly be coming in here what else could be a benefit and also are we going to have to pull this out or redo this because of something else coming in everybody I just want to remind you please stay focused if, if we can on the specific proposals for the results thank you yes you have, no? I, I just want to say something if i can um I just wanted to, I, I like what Thai was saying about developing toolboxes. You know, we, 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 you know, we need to come up with some solutions, you know, for existing problems and also for desired, you know, to solutions. So for example, the picture in the background behind Thai shows agricultural land and an oil and gas well. There's a lot of interest within the agricultural communities for producing more food. There's a big need for the community to produce more food. And so for example, like a great, a great um, project for us could be to think about, okay, what will it take, you know, to treat and, and, and provide sustainable irrigation water in the agricultural community to increase the amount of food produced that would add both agricultural uh, economic benefits, you know, produce more food and, and, and really help us reuse this valuable resources called water. Um, to get to that point, we need to understand the extent to which we need to treat the water, right? How much, how much do we need to treat in order to do that in a sustainable way without causing adverse impacts on soil health, crop health, and human health? So let's make sure we, we consider the agricultural community too, because they could be beneficiaries. Okay. Thank you. I think we got Jacob up there. Great. Thank you, John. Two things to John, your question a while back about produced water specifically or oil and gas more generally, I think the former, I'm not clear if we've answered that yet or not, but to my mind, the former makes the most sense. That's the value proposition of this group that is particularly focused on that one dimension. And then the other thought is about, a, I guess, a proposed result around communities. I, it's a two, I guess. One would be that the local governments themselves feel like they have been earnestly engaged, they've been, they've been able to meaningfully participate in the processes that result in decisions that impact them. So as a result, look, uh, result that we would be writing down here is the local governments that are potentially impacted negatively or positively feel like they've had a meaningful role in those processes. And I would love to do something like that for communities more broadly. I'm thinking of local governments as one proxy. Can I interject something? We can't, yeah. measure, we can't measure how people feel we can measure whether or not they're engaged. I guess I'm not, that's not self-evident to me. And it does seem important that the local governments, there is something about them feeling like they have been engaged. Well, in well let, 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 me, let, me, let me restate it because I do think, I think you both say the same thing. I think, um, you know, the I don't know. I mean, local governments are certainly the in my mind because I used to be local government. The you know a really really important piece in that puzzle. But um, but I think a community and environment, right? So I think that that by, um, you know whatever date, um, decisions and recommendations made by the produced water consortium have um, proactively engaged community in their um, decision-making processes uh, and, and and that can be in a you know a quantifiable way and so that so that that's so that that's you know acknowledge that you know as we make these decisions as we develop these reports as we make these recommendations we highlight how we have engaged proactively with local governments community um, you know a, a, in this so that they are top of the decision-making process. Can I suggest and, everybody that maybe we consider moving this result to that's in currently in education over to the community's priority? 
we can certainly add, you know, proactively engage here, I think. But I think this is thinking, the conversation we're having right now, this is thinking that you've already done. Uh, and, and when we did this, we we knew that there'd be overlap and all the priorities, you know, interplay with each other. They, they all overlap and, and interplay. Uh, so my suggestion is that you consider moving this strategic result. Which one are you going to do? This one that says by X date, communities will have equal opportunity to engage the consortium in its process of making recommendations. I, I would concur with that, sorry. Um, Tessa Sorensen, I, I know I'm superseding a couple of hands. Um, with the expectation it's measurable through participation. Yeah, it is measurable. Yes, Commissioner? Yeah, I agree. Uh, Emma Pinter Adams County, I agree with Tessa's comment. I would also say, um, from our previous conversations, there seemed to be an acknowledgement that communities gesturing broadly, who are not the experts in this room, do not understand these processes. And uh, after education, community might have different comment. And so if community engagement precedes education, we may not get as fruitful of information as if we have iterative ways to gather comment uh, after education is presented. That's a really, that's a really vital comment, I think. Yeah, bingo. Right. And so I think we have to have it in both places, to be honest okay. with you. And so I think this is good, you know, with equal opportunity okay. to engage the consortium. But I also think we need to proactively, we need to proactively okay. consider community and engagement, you know, in our decision making okay. in the you know, in the in the community space as well, and and, and and quantifiably, right? Right, and that's 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 a slightly different, you know, focus. Mm -hmm. Is that in terms of your relating to the, the work of the consortium to engage community, it will be proactive, um, and I think that's a different statement. Okay. Yes, Irene. Irene Andrus. Um, one of the results, maybe a uh, suggestion, is that we develop measurable tools, a tool set of tools yeah, that you right. use to measure whether you have negatively impacted a community or the, the whole water life cycle. So just a, a set of tools that we can run through, a tool set where you can say, yes, we have gone through this process. So Irene, what we've got so far on the is a is by suddenly create tools to identify issues and solutions from a produced water uh, environment or perspective. It sounds like you've got a little bit different take on that. Um, basically, I'd like to see that in order to qualify for a permit or whatever that okay. that they have um, worked through this this. To this matrix that we developed that says, okay, this is, we plug it in and say, is this something that we should allow or not? I, this is Tessa Swanson. I think that's great. And I think that anytime we hear the language to qualify for a permit, we should immediately shunt that idea over into regulatory. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. So, so, so it's not clear. So today when an oil and gas company uh, file for permit to drill or develop they don't go through a permitting uh, a process that evaluate environmental impact. Yeah. yeah. So, but so what's the difference? No, I think hold that thought because I think that once we get to the regulatory legislative piece, we can identify, I think, some knowledge gaps on what current state is um, uh, that we can fill through our education, you know, strategic. Um, results that may you know help inform some of this so okay. yes harmony cummings adding on to that i would like there to be like a continual scorecard like this is what we're doing at the permitting process but at year three year five year ten like to continue to look at the evaluation of what the impacts actually are because we can guess what they are but if we're not continuing to look at that data to see where they actually land out we're not really considering it. Can you hold that till we get to the next priority, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Eric England, uh, this topic of strategy around communities and environment, we've talked about community 
does that imply that that's also addressing environment or is there something separate that we look at? I, I don't know the answer to that, so I'm asking, but I think by in, or in, involving community, we are addressing environment, but I just wanted to make sure that was the case. I think it needs to be specifically called out. Think of all the rural areas where the population density is municipal. I live in a county that has less than one person per square mile. So when we talk about impact to community, in my mind anyway, I'm thinking of communities uh, as opposed to environment and wildlife. Uh, so I think it needs to be explicitly called out. Okay. So what, I, what I'd like to try to do uh, at this point is to identify the specific results that we have some consensus on, okay? And again, take a break and see if we can write those up for you, okay? So one is uh, to create a set of tools to identify issues, solutions, and if I could add the cost benefit to produce water and include that in there, would that, would that be acceptable? Clarifying. Well, yeah, how about risk reward? Yeah. Risk reward, thank yes. you. Yes. How, however you wish to say it, right? Thank you. But that would be part of the toolbox. I, I think we need to be careful of language like cost benefit simply because it makes it um, seem economic mm -hmm. and we need to get away from restricting ourselves that way. Thank you. Brandy, do you have I, a comment I, on that? Yeah, I just wanted to add for that one um, with regards to what Irene and, and Harmony were saying. We could also say and report some type of reporting on this creating, having a toolbox that identifies, but also reports. Okay. I don't know if that helps. That would seem to be one of the outputs. Okay, all right. Uh, the next one that I, I'd highlight is by something, by some date, uh, decisions and recommendations um, made by the consortium include proactive engagement with local governments and communities or something that may be a little out of order, but it's about um, your considerations uh, include proactive engagement with communities and local governments. Somewhat similar to your education uh, focus on um, engaging uh, communities in your consideration of recommendations. Uh, Tessa Sorensen, just a little point of language here that I'd like some feedback from the chair and from uh, uh, Amber on. Uh, is local governments the right way or should it be like proximate? governments because that there's a lot of types of local governments and I wouldn't call the Southern Ute tribe a local government. Right. Was, and tribes. And tribes. Okay. That, that's perfect. Just to make sure it reads right. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, and then back over here, we talked about providing a framework or a set of guidelines that will identify impacted communities or communities that would benefit from produced water. Um, that seems different than creating tools for assessment. Is that correct? Help, help me here. So what we have is uh, provide a set of guidelines or a framework that will identify impacted communities uh, or communities that would benefit. I know we said that quite. Doug White, um, Thank you, I think it, it it still applies, right? If we're going to do an assessment with risk assessment um, or benefit assessment, I, the same would apply either direction. Yeah, I, I think they're combinable. Yeah, they're these. I think the tools, no. tools, the and tools. Guidelines. tools and guidelines. Guidelines are tools. Correct. Right. Okay. But I think I think identifying issues would be a result, right? So what are, I mean, I think that's probably the most important one of all of them that were put on there. Okay. Is identifying the issues, right? Is this a problem? Okay. How big of a problem? So we have that. Yeah. So, but don't combine them. I wouldn't say. I think those are two very separate. Okay. So keep separate, uh, provide a set of guidelines or a framework that will identify impact the communities uh, as well as the benefits. I know we need to work on the plan. Did you kind of so you I, have to identify the issues in order to provide a set of guidelines? Mm -hmm. What if there's no problem, right? 
Or what if there well, is a problem? Government often provides guidelines without assessment. I know. Right. That's what I'm trying to avoid. Just, you know, just say that. I've been there. But I, I want to be really careful on that one, that we are not going to replicate and develop any kind of new definitions uh, around disproportionately impacted communities or cumulative. I mean, the Environmental Justice Task Force and, uh, has done a lot of work on this, and I think we can utilize that information. And so I actually wonder whether that's actually a necessary result, because I think if we create tools to identify issues, and if we determine that produced water considerations that were contemplating as part of this consortium, you know, have issues associated with them, then we're looking at solutions. And one of those could be that we've got a cumulative impacted community or a disproportionately impacted community that has to be contemplated in some of this decision making um, around produced water, then that's already captured and it's already part of our decision making tree. And so I'm not sure, I just worry that that one's going to get us into this this rabbit hole of debating the definition of disproportionately impacted communities so, for the next six months. This is Tessa Sorensen. And so I work for the Environmental Justice Director at CDPHE. And um, my colleagues are those who um, work on the um, EnviroScreen tool, which is a screening tool and is by no means a comprehensive analysis. Um, it does not focus on produced water at all. I think this consortium is very well positioned. I'm not suggesting we redefine disproportionately impacted communities. I'm suggesting that we provide guidelines to identify how do you see, how do you find places that could have produced water benefits or issues? Not defining a community as a disproportionately impacted produced water community, whatever that might be defined as, but how do you identify that in the first place? What are the actual guidelines around that, which could then be utilized by another organization, another um, state team or, or other um, party to develop a tool around those guidelines to execute them? Uh, just asking related to that, Eric England, how can we as a recommending body create a framework or recommend a framework like that that would be adopted or utilized? Right. I think that's an excellent question. And I think the simple answer is by utilizing the results of our research gap analysis. By knowing our research gap analysis with this consortium, we'll be able to um, identify what are the major factors that are clear indicators of the potential for beneficial use, that are clear indicators of the potential of high dis um, uh, negative impacts and high positive impacts um, for certain communities. Like what are those indicators is the guidelines. Yeah, I still I, I still don't understand the difference between that one and, and create tools for identifying issues. Um, I'm not sure I do either. That's why I suggested mine first. Yeah, but I think that this one's better. <laughs> Michalina Pollock, maybe it shouldn't say create tools. It should just say identify potential issues or identify if there are issues. Well, one thing you could do is to create tools and guidelines to identify. I mean. Sure. That's great. And and Tessa starts it again. I think it would be a mistake to assume there is zero human cost for any yeah. operation involving humans. Of course. I mean, that, that goes into this set of guidelines. Okay. Um, over here, uh, we have this really interesting and lovely, I think, proposal for uh, a statewide collaboration of reuse, recycling, and disposal of produced water on an inter uh, and develop interbasin strategies that I need, uh, identify points of imbalance or um, inner, I'm going to say this all wrong. <laughs> uh, in other words, a statewide collaboration that's, that's across basins for um, the use Recycling and disposal <clears throat> of produce water. Was that close? Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's just, um, some, this is a real opportunity to identify yeah. your beneficial use 
right. different lots of different users. Okay. I think we can or I think we can write that so that it fits with what you were proposing. Is there a consensus that that's an important result? Since it is, yes. yeah, since it is. Okay. And the last one is here by some, someday literally, you know, identifying a result for the reason that the consortium exists, which is reduce the use of fresh water and increase the amount of reuse of produced water. That belong here, yes, sir. Uh, this is Mark have to Chevron. That I, that's a great uh result, but I mean, like you said, it's the whole meaning of our whole commission uh, to put it as one result in one strategy seems like almost minimizing that goal, right? And yeah. the, the, the when I was mentioning it, I was thinking it went in the uh the introduction of all of these elements, uh, because that is the uber allis, right? It's it's yeah, it's preamble, it's basically the bumper sticker. Right? But but remember the way that the strategic results process looks is that you've got the strategic priorities, you've got the strategic results, and then you've got you know a laundry list of 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 actions that need to take place in order for this strategic result to to occur, right? And so I think it's a good idea to keep it as and and I hear you, right? Uh, it's you know so to me the date I think the legislation has us needing to sunshine and be re-upped in 2030 or something like that. So I think that date is actually 2030. But then inside of that, in your in your actions, and I know there's other things that I'm forgetting, but um, strategies um, that you've got specific dates, specific benchmarks that you're putting in there that would ultimately tie to that. And I think that can be. So I mean, I uh, we get we only got time for a couple of comments. I mean, you have to share down there. Yeah, I, Irene Andrus, just in the one that you have on the top there, I'm wondering if we want to make add the word cumulative in there somehow so that you're you're not looking at these things in isolation when you look at the tool, but you're looking at a global picture of everything also. Like, But you're going to be doing this in, in the same place where this is also taking place. So there's a cumulative impact. And I think... I, I, I think that what we've when we've touched on that uh, in this discussion, we said that would probably end up in in legislation in the next. So, so that I'm just in that one sentence. Create tools and guidelines to identify issues and solutions, risk and rewards, and re cumulative it's issues. Just a sure. I, I I yeah I think I think I think I mean I hear you I hear what you're trying to accomplish. But there's there's actually um, like direct issues, and then there's cumulative issues, and I don't know as there's uh, I don't know as we want to specify. I guess yeah. One more, Barbara. So as I read what is up on the paper, I don't see the word environment in any of them. So either we address environment in some way explicitly or we create a separate uh list i might suggest that we say communities and their environments well it's not just the human environment True. right this is the yes. point i'm trying to make is I we're mean, talking about environment to the planet climate change we're talking about the environment for wildlife and uh, i would assume when we speak on the words issues or impacts we are it is possibly by definition on um that we define um, to be both human and environmental impact. So, so let's put those words in there. Yeah. I was going to suggest too, I don't know if this is similar to like a preamble, but defining what we mean by community and environment. So then just every time we say community environment, there's a place to go. That means it means the stakeholders of ag and, you know, local municipalities and people but who it's live. Not just humans. Correct. Right. And also environment, meaning wildlife, climate change, land yeah. use, soil quality, all the things. But let's get the word environment in there along with community, please. All right. So maybe on, on the same note, so we know who will represent the communities, but who will represent the environment? We, we will speak in a lot. Okay, just, just don't fight. Yeah. Uh, Doug White. That's in my agency name. Don't, we, don't these fall under one conversation? Don't these fall under community environment? Yeah, this is a priority. So okay, so shouldn't they all be community environment because they fall under the heading community environment? Why would we need to add them in there? And in, into these each individual item. 
what what I would suggest it's it's a little bit like oil and gas basins, right? So what what I would suggest is that right now we write these up. They're within the community and environment priority. And if you all uh, later want to wordsmith and put it in there, I'd say we do. Otherwise, I would suggest we go with these, knowing that it's environment, it's the community and environment. Mark, before you consolidate those, sure. um, Tessa Sorensen, question related to Doug's comment, our, um, and for the entire group, looking at what we've written up there and what we've suggested, are any of them specifically only for communities or only for the environment? Are they are, are are some of them separatable to be only commu meaning communities? And we see the word community multiple right. times. Right. So so all, which items on there do include environment so that we can write it on there? Well, let me just make a suggestion. So I mean the, the one specificity I see there. So decisions, recommendations, uh or identify issues that, that covers both. That second one is you know, specific to community. Um, and so you could you could duplicate that that says, you know, recommendations that are that are being, you know, considered by uh, the consortium, you know, shall, um, you know, consider impacts to the environment, um, you know, or something like that as a, as a big arching strategic goal or strategic result, although that's not actionable. But you could do another one that's similar to that, but I think that one's community based, and then some other ones, you know, are incorporating in the environment. But to Barbara's point, if we want to ensure that environment is incorporated, I would take something that like that that community local government one and just modify it to say that we will, you know, identify environmental issues, identify and quantify environmental issues associated by, uh, with recommendations that this consortium makes, and then, you know, have specific strategies and actions associated with that in the implementation plan. <clears throat> Thanks. We'll take that. Thank you. Everyone, I think that we've got consensus on what will be included. Uh, give us about 10 minutes and we'll write them up for you and uh, see if we're there. Yes. Is it possible that and we can get them on the screen so that we can see it and the folks that are online can see it also? It's I like to I, for me, I need to read things. <laughs> to, to be I, I know. And I, we can't see it over here. Well, we'll write them up bigger, but I don't think we have time to do that, too. Thanks. Okay, everybody, 10 minutes. Hey, just just one one, one second before folks go. Uh, hope where are we at with lunch? So lunch is available and outside so please grab your lunch when you return and bring your lunch with you as well as your turkey. That's different. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, kick it to uh, Marv and Darcy and see what we've, what we've come up with. If Marv is talking, I can't hear him online. No. Sorry. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. By such and such a date, create tools and guidelines to identify issues and solutions, risk and rewards, and reports from a produced water perspective. That's pretty much verbatim. I think what we heard. No consensus on that. Okay. Next, <clears throat> by such and such a date, can you hear me it's better there? Is that okay? It's coming through great. That's good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for telling me. By such and such a date, decisions and recommendations by the CPWC will proactively engage and consider local governments, tribes, and communities. And environmental. Well, that's what we were talking about here. We, so what we did, Barbara, let me let me sh share with you what okay. we did. So we jumped ahead over here, right? It created something separate that said by such and such a date, 
uh, CPWC decisions and recommendations will proactively consider impacts on the environment. I didn't write that. That's okay. We just hadn't gotten there. So that was our, our question, whether or not we wanted to include environmental groups here or we wanted this, and that would be different. This is a little different than engaging environmental groups. That's fine. This is okay? Okay, we're good on this? Okay, yeah. all right. So coming back to the middle. Oh, Lauren, okay. good question right there. <laughs> Let me continue first. Yeah, I, don't, I kind of like the line. I, I please no to make the mirror no please <laughs> that's fine commissioner did you anybody commissioner um I just had a question about um the previous summary about local governments and I want to make sure I'm looking at the right one um. So when you, I think that I would like to ask a question of the group because I don't understand, or maybe you can explain it to me. Um, local governments is a really broad term. And we have discussed a lot of varieties of local governments here. Uh, municipalities are different from county commissions and county commissions have the public health authority. And both of these are frequently different from water and sewer. And so I am just a little confused because frequently, statutorily, when folks say local government, the default, at least at the legislature, is they mean cities exclusively. And so I, I don't think that was what I heard in this room. And so I'm looking for some reassurance on how we're going to delineate the various types of local government. So, so Commissioner, I've got a suggestion. I, I hear you. Our, our consulting practice is largely with you know, local government entities. What I would suggest is you're talking about districts, you're talking about even townships, you're talking about all those things. One thing you could do is consider local government entities. And that that may be a way to broaden it. But honestly, I don't hear, and, and I'm trying to shortcut this, obviously, I don't hear anyone here in the consortium limiting it to, to cities. Maybe the legislature does, but- I'm not hearing that from this room. Right. Other people who read this later, Okay. may infer that definition because it is commonly used mm -hmm. at the legislature so, and in other gov state government documents. So, Commissioner, knowing that that is, a, is a, uh, maybe a literacy issue in the legislature, I'm getting now, right? right? Can we say local government entities? Can we just define local <clears throat> government and put things under it, like municipalities and whatever else it may be? What I'm trying to do is not list them. Right, but I mean, like in a definition section, or sure. yeah. Well, and keep in mind, I mean, we're we're not making rules. Um, we're making a strategic right uh, plan, and local government is utilized all through ECMC regulations, and it does mean counties, and it does mean special districts, and it does mean you know okay. municipalities. And I, I mean, I hear what you're saying. I'm not sure we're going to get hung up. Anything that's involving at least ECMC. Local governments include all those things, including the legislation that developed, you know, a lot of the statutory authority associated with ECMC that utilizes the term local governments that include both counties and municipalities. So would it also include water districts just because of the unique function of this commission? I think if you utilize the word entity, then I think that that okay. does capture then I'm good that. With that as well as Thank special you. districts as well. Um, Sure. Uh, by such and such a date, decisions and recommendations by the CPWC will proactively engage and consider local government <laughs> entities, tribes, and communities. Are we good with that? Okay. We come back here to the middle. By such and such a date, provide, and, and I, this is a term that we've been able to provide a framework of guidelines that will identify communities impacted and benefited from produced water. We, we almost tongue-tied on this one. Is the word framework necessary? Not necessary, it was used. Yeah. Provide guidelines that will identify communities impacted and benefited from produced water. with that 
Do we you're, want to? You're frowning at me. To... <laughs> you look at me. Yeah. <laughs> so, to, Tessa Sorensen, do we need to put the word potentially before benefited? Potentially benefited? Because it may not be now. Yeah, it's they may right. Everyone's impacted. Not everyone is, is benefited. The entire state is in a drought, yeah. often. Let's not argue it, everybody. Let's just focus, please, really on the language. Like Can we please just focus on the language, please? Okay. Provide okay. guidelines that will identify communities impacted and or benefited from produced water. Like potentially. Well, they're potentially impacted, too. Right. Communities potentially impacted and benefited. Okay. Yes, sir. Joe, sir. Joe Ryan. Uh, I'd like to say the committee, the I'm sorry, the consortium would avoid impacting uh, uh, communities in that way rather than just making guidelines for it. Okay. So those are two different steps, right, Joe? Right. One is to provide guidelines that identify. I mean, wouldn't the next step be to identify them? And that's a, is that what you're saying? In in what the course consortium does, hopefully uh, avoid impacts, not just identify guidelines to. What uh, um, uh, does it say to create guidelines that identify the communities? Well, provide guidelines that will yeah. that will identify communities impacted and benefit. Potentially. Impacts can be positive and negative. So perhaps so, we yeah. could just say that we'll identify positive and negative impacts to communities from produce water. That way, I don't know, just I a suggestion. Positive and negative impacts on communities. Okay. Like that. Like that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> What's that? Uh, Mike Freeman, I see your hand up. Uh, yes, thank you very, thank you, uh, Commissioner Messner. I had one question on this one, and I apologize if um, this issue is being addressed in one of the other ones. I, I can't really read the the butcher block paper on the wall. Um, I know there was some discussion before the break about including the environment expressly in addition to communities. Um, would it be appropriate to include communities and the environment or environmental resources here? So it might read something like, by X date, provide guidelines or a framework for identifying positive and negative impacts to communities and environmental resources. So the way this might read, if we, if we incorporate all that, is um, by X8, provide guidelines that identify positive and negative impacts on communities and the environment. Yep. Hang on just a second, Irene. Okay, I'm gonna ask if we have consensus on that before we edit it some more. Do we have consensus on that? Everybody, I'm looking for you. I know you're eating. I'm hustling here. Okay. Irene, I think we have consensus. Is there is there something that we need to change? I was just thinking adding and remediation because if it's an impact, then we also want to, if we're identifying the impact, do we also want to identify the steps that we're going to do for remediation? You want to add that? Yeah, no? I'm asking. Well, <clears throat> good question. I, I mean, so we're we're providing guidelines that will identify communities. That's all this is doing. We're identifying communities, so that's it. So I don't know how you remediate identifying a community. I saw about four people shake their heads as well, but none of them turned on a microphone. Well, so I might pick on James Rosenbaum since I saw a really violent shake of the head over there on that. The chime in. But, well, before before we have more discussion, hang on. I do have to limit it. You know that, right? 
We are providing guidelines that here identify positive and negative impacts. And over here, we're identifying communities. Which do you want to do? Oh, my fault. I didn't understand. I thought that was a new one. Um, <laughs> and so we can do that too. Uh, we can do both. That's that's my you fault. Do both, John? I want to do two. Yeah. The. I mean, listen. We're we're a recommend recommending body, right? So the the idea that we're going to be developing rules or 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 promulgating things that are going to be able to you know require certain things to happen um, is is not the role of, of this consortium. But we can certainly identify communities that are impacted positively, negatively. We can identify uh, impacts. So that's possible. Um, we can even make recommendations to state agencies on rules that may address these things. But um, but this is, you know, part of what we've got here is going to be captured in the legislative piece where we've already got strategic results associated with some of the things that are being highlighted here. Except for there's nothing in the legislative piece that identifies communities impacted positively or negatively by produced water. And so I think that ends up being an important one. So everybody, can, can we just step back just a minute? And I, and I know there's more discussion, but we really have to get... It is 12.15, and we have been on this quite a lot longer than an hour and 15 minutes. So we're down to making decisions and not discussing further, okay? All right? So I'm going to ask for a decision. Do we, do you have consensus on, by X8, provide guidelines that will identify communities impacted positively and negatively from produced water? Yes. So that? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> So do we also need or want an additional result where you're providing guidelines that identify positive and negative impacts on communities and environment, or is that already gonna happen here? Because remember you have this one <clears throat> about CPWC decisions and recommendations proactively considering impacts on the environment. Do you need this? Do you need this in addition to that and that? The, the reason why I think we potentially need the second one is in addition to it. Yeah, yes, why we potentially need that second one. one. Yes, with in addition to it, because when we identify negative impacts and to add to what Irene was saying, to possibly add negative impacts and also identify potential mitigation and remediation points, um, because just to say that I think we need to provide that to people when we're giving these things and saying this, and that's where I see a distinction. But Doug White, um, wouldn't that fall within regulatory? <laughs> but but maybe not. Doesn't it already fall within regulatory? I believe existing ECMC rules and regulations cover any sort of remediate current remediation. Tessa. C, uh, CDPHE, do they already have rules and regs around remediation around? Uh, remediation, yes, in general, um, at ECMC and CDPHE both in terms, and, and DWR for that matter. But uh, in terms of produced water, I don't know the answer to that. ECMC, e ECMC, I Well, I mean, sure, we, we've, got, we've got rules around this. this. What this is trying to identify I think I think Marv, to your point, those two things say the same thing because the CPW or CPWC decisions and recommendations will proactively consider impacts on the environment. We're going to make recommendations potentially on we think that there should be this kind of infrastructure, or we think that we should reuse and recycle, you know, this much produced water in these basins. Well, there's potential environmental impacts associated from those both positively and negatively. We need to be able to make decisions that consider those impacts. And when you consider those impacts, you're 
you're evaluating and 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 then making recommendations for how to address those potential impacts and those recommendations. And so I think that those strategies and actions get captured underneath the top one there. I'm not sure it's necessary to include the second no, over this way. Yeah, uh, not not the second one, but that's my opinion. Not this. Because I, have, I think we just got to keep going back to what our mission here is and what we're going to be doing and how this applies. We're not we're not here just to have conversations about you know potential impacts. We're here to make recommendations, and we have to be very action oriented with that. And so, considering impacts on the environment uh, are going to be really important on how to evaluate and address those impacts in our recommendations. So, and to piggyback off of that, this is Nikki Wills. Each environment and community has their own different impacts that we will have to deal with. Absolutely. And I, I think that's what this is about, is identifying <clears throat> communities and what their issues are, I believe. So I'm going to ask again, you, you have this one, you've agreed to this which is provide guidelines that will identify communities impacted positively and negatively by produced water. And decision, your decisions and recommendations will proactively consider impacts on the environment, right? Is this fundamentally different enough to stand alone as another strategic result, say, provide guidelines that identify positive and negative impacts on communities and environments? I think you're going to do that when you do this and when you do that. Very good with that? All right. Well, that was hard to plot and well. All right. And we have, we have one more. Okay. All right. Here we go. All right. By such and such a day, state, and, and we, we played with the language here. So, so bear with us and, and you'll, you'll improve it. By such and such a day, statewide and interbasin collaboration and planning regarding reuse, recycling, and disposal of produced water will identify and map points of imbalance. We play this a little bit. May we please add, um, so map points of imbalance and, and add a, a um, a benefit or some sort of like collaboration or synergy or so we'll see imbalances but we'll also see how about identify and map points of imbalance <clears throat> and opportunity yes that's perfect thank you you all are really good at the mother tongue so let me read that again by such and such day, statewide and interbasin collaboration and planning regarding reuse, recycling, and disposal of produced water will identify and map points of imbalance and energy. Are we good on that? Yes. I just have one question, I guess. The inter is it interbasin I N T E R, like between basins? Help help me. Yeah. yeah, I think it's inter. I would think it would be within the basin. I think it's both. No, the idea was to go beyond just to go beyond within the basin. Statewide. It was to go statewide, right? Yeah. So right? I guess I wonder. I mean, do we need to have the term inter basin? I, I guess it can mean many different things. And is it enough to just say statewide? People. Yes, it should stay. Yes, I think it should just stay statewide. But and and I say that because I think that there's opportunities here in in intra basin and inter basin. Okay, um, they're both clearly they're both opportunities. Right. Okay, you good with that? So, it, are we taking off that word? Okay. It. So it's statewide collaboration planning. Does that work for you, Tracy? Yeah, thanks so much. Okay, so let me read it one more time. By such and such a date, statewide collaboration and planning 
regarding reuse, recycling, and disposal of produced water will identify and map points of imbalance and opportunity. And you still are. That's still good. Okay. All right. All right, everybody, we good? Yes. Ah, we did it. We did it. <laughs> All right. Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, Eric England, and you can tell me too little, too late. That bottom one on the left, could you just, um, I guess, restate it or help me understand it? Sure. Yeah. The decisions and recommendations will proactively engage and consider local governments. It seems like there's something missing in, in how that's stated. We agree. There's a little verb issue here that we'll fix. I okay. think if you All make right, CPWC the. Um, okay. Subject. Not yeah. the By Thank blank, you. the <laughs> CPWC will proactively engage and consider local governments, tribes, and communities in decisions and recommendations. Let's, yeah, yeah. We, we know there's a lot. I think we could do that. Thank you. Or just slow it is. Yeah. Yes. All right, what's next? All right, well, what's next is a good time called legislation and policy. <laughs> and we have about 35 minutes if we stay within our time frame. So um, what, I, what I'd like to suggest and then I realize that this is way over facilitating. John, would you care to make a recommendation in this area? Well, I, now you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe if I remember back to the 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 feedback that everyone gave Marv and Jeremy during their interview process highlighted you know different legislative pieces regulatory pieces policy pieces primarily as what are the barriers that these things are providing to being able to meet the mission of the consortium which is to reduce the amount of fresh water that's being used increase the amount of reuse and recycling that's occurring and so and and I think we do have a specific deliverable within the legislation itself to identify regulatory legislative uh, and policy barriers to reuse and recycling in the state and so i think that's one piece of it i think the uh, the second piece of it is <clears throat> is there legislation or regulations or policy that needs to occur that is not currently available that would better enable reuse and recycling uh, of produced water and reduction of fresh water. And so I think those are the two buckets that I see. And so I'm not sure how to tie those buckets directly into strategic results yet, but I'd like, does anyone, does those seem like the buckets? I think we need a third and that is uh, regulation or legislation needed to protect environment and communities uh, as we increase the treatment transport, storage, and reuse of produced water. Okay. And, and that would get to the kind of standard standardization that we earlier mentioned. Right. Barbara, um, we're catching up a little bit. Could you repeat that, please? It probably won't be exactly the way I said no, it, it but we matter. need, we need uh, to consider uh, recommendations for legislation or regulation that is protective of environment and community as we expand the treatment, transport, reuse of um, produced water. And, and maybe like lists and limits or constituents that are protective of exactly. environment and public health. Thank you, James. I, I guess I'm asking for a point of clarification and similar to the de-wasting regulations in other states, is that something that has to come through regular or can that just come through standards from this body or CDPHE? Where does that come into play? So, so we're, we recommend things. We don't have any authority to do anything but recommend. And so this body, I think it's important to understand that. Right. But like, but, you see, does the ECMC or CDPHE meet those standards or does it have to come from legislation? Our authority at ECMC and CDPHE is provided by statute. Um, and so, yes, to the legislative piece. But, but Barbara, I want to better understand, I think, what you're asking, because I, I'm, I'm seeing 
So we've got legislation that we need in order to be able to meet the mission of the consortium, the expectation that, that was provided in the legislation, which is reduction of fresh water, increase in reuse and recycling. We've got barriers and we've got needs. We just got done doing a strategic result that says um, we will proactively consider the environment and our decisions and recommendations. Um, so I'm, I guess my question is, unless you're thinking of specific legislation that needs to happen that says, you know, the Produce Water Consortium shall um, only make recommendations that are protective of the environment, that needs to be a bill. I'm not sure we need that piece in there in addition to the one in community, but I don't want to, uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding. So uh, we're talking about both agency regulation, our recommendations to agencies for uh, rules and regulations, right? And potential okay. recommendation regarding legislation. That's correct. Um, but what I'm envisioning is we increase the infrastructure for storage, treatment, reuse of produced water and transportation piping of reduced water. There may be some new issues that come up regarding protecting the environment Correct. that we have not envisioned yet, do not yet exist in regulation. And I think it's important when we're talking about uh, rules and legislation that this be included, not just what are the barriers to increase it, what are the potential issues we have to consider to support the expansion of reuse without damaging the environment right i mean i i hear your intent i think again my question is um you know we'll make recommendations for legislation or or regulation either to decrease barriers or to you know create opportunities um the uh, that, that aren't currently there we've already got a strategic result that says the environment you know, shall be, you know, proactively considered in our decision making. Local governments and communities mm -hmm. will proactively be engaged in our decision making. So any of these recommendations we make in this level have to still go through the lens of what we just talked about in community and environment. So I I, I, I got that part, but yeah. uh, as you presented it, you were looking at reducing barriers, enabling, right? And I just want to make sure that we're looking at the risk and reward. Uh, including the risk. Sure. Safely enabling. Safely. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Michael uh, so Freeman's it, it, Because it was what? presented as such a positive knock down the barriers and enable, I want to make sure that we're doing it without mm -hmm. uh, considering. I think that's fair. Issue. Yeah, okay. I hear what you're saying. Thank now. you. Yeah. Chair, we've had a hand raised on online for a bit. Uh, Mike? Uh, uh, thank you, Commissioner Messner. Um, I... Uh, in thinking about this, I, I uh, feel tend to agree with your take that a lot of what we're talking about with policy and regulation flows from both the statutory deliverables we have. We, I think we've got recommendations on policies to overcome hurdles due in May, and then recommendations on statute and regulatory changes due in November. Um, I wonder if, if in terms of action items uh, here, we could... Uh, I think frame it that way to say, look, we um, first we need to identify um, in order to meet our goals, both for community and the environment and uh, and what comes out of the research component, uh, what's necessary and uh, what options there are for meeting those goals for future for the future state we want to achieve. Um, and then as part of that, which of those require actually require legislation, which could be done? by regulation, either from the ECMC or CDPHE, and which could be done just with policy. Because I, I can imagine a lot of what we liked, what we might recommend could be done uh, through MOUs or policy steps without requiring new regulations or, um, uh, or legislation. And then the second item might be uh, just to make recommendations as to specific policies, regulations, or legislation to accomplish both of those two statutory goals. Um, and I, I also think it would be worth, um, I think wrapping into both of those uh, language to make clear that, it, it, that uh, our recommendations will include not just how to increase produce water reuse, but also how to do it safely 
and with protections for the environment. So uh, that's a lot there, but I think um, maybe two action items that are focused on um, you know, surveying and identifying what we need, what options we have in terms of policy regulation and legislation for the, uh, the deliverables, and then making recommendations as to specific options for those to do it all in a way that's safe and protective of communities and the environment. Some of that, Michael, I think will flow out into the uh, implementation plan. I think you'll get very specific about those those very specific aspects of recommendations. Um, that's just a thought. So let, let me, let me, oh, sorry, go ahead. Amber. Go ahead. <clears throat> Amber Michael, um, another out of the box thought, and maybe it's not out of the box, but um, could we, so with emissions, we have a cap and trade or a carbon tax, something like that at a federal level and state levels. Could we maybe explore the idea of doing something with that aspect with water and potentially incentivizing, um, say, less capitalized operators or other operators to be able to, to do something with water? And I, it's just coming to my head so we could build on it. And I don't know if that's possible in the state, but then that would encourage the use, uh, reuse, recycling of water um, and at a local or excuse me, not local, but a state level, perhaps we could do some sort of credits like that. Not sure if that's beyond our scope of this, but just thinking about policy and regulation, just trying to have a small actionable item to think about. Doug White, uh, we think that's a great idea. So if you want to incent this industry even more so than it already is, just you know the way it already we want to do it, but certainly in saying the economics it makes sense. But we also have to think about the other, you know, you think about the community's impact, et cetera. Maybe that's a better place for the funds to go, but certainly we all know economic incentives can help drive things. And it can help the community with the infrastructure. There's, I think there's a lot of potential for um, community benefits and recycling, reuse, long-term beneficial, beneficial use. So, and, so I think, uh, hold on before, Mara, before you get there, I think in context of legislation and policy, it would be making recommendations for um, ways to incentivize that, right? Yeah. Not incentivizing it, but making recommendations for how to um, incentivize it through either legislation or policy. Right. So what we're, right, clearly making recommendations, but to incentivize what? <clears throat> to incentivize and please help me build off of this idea but to incentivize um the reuse and recycling of okay. produced water um and however that looks like whether it's per barrel or per acre foot and then be able to incentivize infrastructure building smart infrastructure building with the storage disposal those types of things which kind of toggles into the statewide plan and then communities could benefit again with infrastructure and education history. Yeah, that's a good one. Incentivize historical impacts. Do you want kind to of just where incentivize the, the reuse and recycling of produced water? Can I, can I make a quick comment? This is Jeff uh, Kirtland. Yes, uh, you know, from an industry perspective, I, you know, this, this may be part of an outcome of identifying some of the differences between basins uh, in, in our research. Um, okay. That, because incentives may not work for, for different operators or for different parts of the basin. I think, I think understanding better what each basin's requirements are and what the challenges are, um, you know, are, are very important. I mean, there, there are additional costs that may not make the incentives worthwhile. From an operational standpoint, let, 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 let me let me make a suggestion as far as the structure of this goes, because I I, I feel us getting we could identify very specific things all day long as far as what the potential barriers are, what the potential incentives are, you know whether that's you know barriers being water share agreements, water rights, you know non tributary versus tributary. I mean, there's there's a list of barriers that are out there. There's a list of opportunities that are out there, but maybe we can structure this as you know what by this date we identify, which is already part of the legislative piece, and so I I acknowledge this, but this should be in here as well. 
but that we identify, you know, legislative, regulatory, and policy barriers. By this date, we, um, by this date, we identify, you know, opportunities uh, to um, legislative, regulatory, and policy opportunities to increase the amount of reuse and recycling of produced water. Um, you know, something very broad, but but like kind of hits this, and then and then as we try to implement these, we set aside time through our strategies, implementation plans to really have these more in-depth conversations about what the barriers are, what the opportunities are, and what and and how we're going to evaluate the potential impacts, positive and negative, to communities and the environment. So, so John, what I've done is use some of your, uh, you know, recent language, what you just said, is by such and such a date, identify the regulatory, legislative, and policy barriers which impede the mission of the CPWC, which is to increase, to decrease the use of fresh water and to increase the reuse and recycling of produced water, correct? We can, set, we can say that. And then uh, correspondingly, by such and such a date, identify the regulatory, legislative, and policy opportunities to achieve the mission of the CPWC. Is that what you just said? Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to say it again. Yep. Yeah. Uh, by such and such a date, identify the regulatory, legislative, and policy opportunities, maybe which uh, advance the achievement or uh, to achieve the mission of the yeah yeah, yeah that's right. Sorry. But I think that's what you said. Emma, tell me yes. different. I'm I'm not here to tell you different. I'm waiting in line for next. Oh. But if you would like a pause to thoughtfully consider and then come back, I'm happy to. No, but divert us for a second and then we can come back. Okay, so I appreciate this. And I think that um, government regulations that start with an incentive are often best practice. And so I appreciate this framing. However, I have some concerns that incentives as was Jeff shared may not be enough. And so while we are identifying barriers, we also need to be explicit about minimum floors for safety and well being in community. And so I am in favor of incentives, but it's not to say here's an incentive to do better, but if you can't meet it, continue on as usual. I think mm -hmm. there should be a minimum threshold of. Uh, our research shows that if you meet this minimum threshold, to the best of our understanding, this water will be safe for use. And while I know we're discussing barriers here, like sometimes um, it, it, like an accidental inverse can be implied. And so I don't want to have any of this language, and I, I appreciate the creativity here, neglect some of the things we discussed in our previous meetings that there needs to be minimum thresholds. And I, I, I think commissioner that was addressed in the previous result about tools and guidelines that assess the risk and rewards. I think. I, I hear that, but sometimes giving direction to develop incentives can feel like to a reader who's not us or us six months from now when we've forgotten might accidentally set us up to only do incentives as opposed to minimum thresholds. And, and what I heard, thank you for that. What I heard, I think you say, John, is that incentives is just one thing. It's one strategy. Yeah, I'm saying, yeah. Well, what, what I was saying is I was saying, throw that sucker out and just That's go with that mean. and then and then bring that back with whatever improvements need to happen as we develop, you know, strategies and actions, which is kind of the next step of the implementation plan. So that we're taking that that level of detail that you're talking about, which I think is really important considerations, 
and incorporating that in <clears throat> in the implementation piece of it. Um, I, th I think the idea was to take out the the specific recommendation about incentives. Yeah, I right. think Emma. I think the minimum threshold for this consortium is to is to, is to recommend minimum thresholds. Okay, right. That that's great. I, and I and I like incentives, but I just want everything to like reference that. I think you're right. We should write that down. That it should be one of our biggest strategic goals here is to is to recommend to identify and recommend minimum thresholds standards. Or um, was right there to be to be uh, given to legislators and policymakers. For, thresholds for what? Yeah. Water like quality. Okay, so you're talking about water. That we've done, we create, you're able to create those minimum thresholds. Well, and then may, yeah, and maybe a barrier just to, you know, freestyle yes. on this for a minute is that a barrier that we're facing is we don't yet have the research and community yeah. feedback yeah. to be able to yet identify that minimum threshold, yeah. which we are seeking to identify. And once that is done, we'd like to do, you know, next level things like provide incentives for, um, Oh God, the only thing that's coming up for me is like, you know, good behavior, which is not the right phrase. <laughs> I, I just uh, uh, join an end. I mean, part of the re legislation was to have a, vo a volume. I think there was some volume percentage or that we that was going to be recommended. So I think that that's correct. We do have right to make target. we have to make recommendations. Cloel's had her hand up for a while. So I think it's important to Randy listen to Cloel. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I. Uh, I think I'm just going to echo, echo what was just discussed, but I, I don't I don't want to lose the potential outside reuse. I mean, it's you know barriers to reuse within the oil field and potentially outside the oil field, given that we have research in place. So I, I just really want to emphasize not incentivizing reuse ahead of the science. Grant, uh, Grant from Select Water. I, on this, uh, I, I just some points of clarification. We're talking about minimum barriers for uh, environmental concerns, et cetera. I think that maybe we should identify different barriers for infield reuse impacts versus uh, beneficial reuse, whether that's agriculture, potable water, uh, all that type of stuff. So different categories there. And then to what James is already saying, which is if the, rec if the recommendations inside the legislation, which is the way I read 1242, that there should be some minimum volume of consumption to replace a percentage of fresh water. That's where the incentives come in. Because if we're going to require a certain, it's, it's there's a lot um, more hurdles, uh, regulatory and economically, to using reusing water versus what, uh, fresh water available. I think maybe we address address both volumes and then categories of reuse is the words I guess I'm looking for here. Quantity and quality. Okay. Right. right. Yes. Quantity and quality in the different contexts. Cause there's a, I'm working on both of these projects right now. And there's a huge difference between what we can reuse in field versus what I can discharge into a, a waters of the United States. And so that needs to be clarified here. So <clears throat> that's, that was really helpful. Uh, when we talk about minimum thresholds, what are we talking about? Are we talking about so I, thresholds I, for infield reuse um, and other uses such as ag? Are we really talking about levels of toxicity that are acceptable for different uses? Are you talking about categories, right? Like we're trying to describe minimum right. thresholds. Yes, and I, I they think that would be identified differently, but this legislation itself, and correct me if I'm wrong, Commissioner, is uh, specifically for reducing fresh water inside the oil field reuse, and beneficial reuse is tacked onto the backside of that. Yeah, I mean, there are two different things that we're talking about here. I mean, there's different, there, well, there's different, going to be different tr treatment thresholds, you know, or minimum thresholds, depending on what the fit for use you know, purpose or the fit for purpose is, right? And so, um, you know, I think this gets really in the weeds um, as far as a strategic result goes. Um, but I think it's certainly aspirational and actually is contemplated in the legislation as well to be 
delivered in like two years, right? And so, um, so I certainly think it could be part of what we're considering here. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if this is a barrier. I don't know if this is an opportunity. I see it more as a research, you know, necessary research piece, but, um, but I don't know. I don't know exactly where that fits, but I, I acknowledge that that is, that is something that we will be doing. I just don't know where it fits. So just to acknowledge too, that we're not sure we've written it correctly. Grant, we tried to, you know, get at what you were talking about, infield views, threat minimum, uh, you know, treatment, thresholds for recycling in field and then other uses uh, beyond the field right and and we'll need some help in articulating that correct language but go ahead no i was just agreeing with you okay can you adjust the chat screen? yes sorry about that um let's see uh clay well yeah i i appreciate the the nod I, I, this was hitting home Pretty closely to one of the concepts I identified early, and that was uh, trying to figure out how to help uh, interagency collaboration to promote uh, both the reduction of use of fresh water and the increase of produced water in the oil field applications. And so I, I threw out early the concept of a tangible kind of result being we, we create a roadmap that helps capture and ensure collaboration um, between agencies to help promote, you know, the uh, objectives of the CPWC. I, I'm not sure how that lands on everybody, but to me, it's a practical step, uh, a result oriented idea uh, to achieve some of these concepts. Well, yeah, I, hear, I, I really hear you. We've heard that in some of our interview conversations. And I wonder if, Identifying the regulatory barriers accomplishes that or gets at that. Well, I think it does accomplish identifying what the barriers are and clarifies them, but I don't think that necessarily ensures any any movement toward uh, eliminating them. It does not. So the second one, let me see if this does. Identifying the regulatory legislative and policy opportunities to achieve your mission. All right. So Tessa Sorensen, I'm I'm staring at the bill right now, um, just because I feel like it's necessary to come back to some of the legislative requirements here for uh, um, legislative and agency rules. And it specifically cites um, not only um, recommending how state and federal agencies can better coordinate policies, um, and I'm summarizing here, uh, uh, but also any legislation or agency rules needed to remove barriers to the safe recycling and reuse of produced water in the in the state, taking into account many, many considerations I will not list. It does not say infield. It simply says safe recycling and reuse of produced water in the state. Not that I think we're necessarily going to reach the finishing line in 10 minutes. Kevin? No, I, I, uh, I agree. Okay. okay. Well, I was simply uh, advocating that once we've identified those barriers, if we create a, a roadmap or something that captures those things and places and puts them in, in a reactive uh, behavioral form, maybe that satisfies the concern over having a, a, a behavioral result. I mean, I think what I hear Clay saying is he wants to evaluate and address, right? Uh, and so in that way, make recommendations on how to how to overcome those barriers. Uh, and I think that we capture that in that second one, because we'd be looking at policy regulation or legislation that would um, that would overcome those barriers or would, um, you know, create opportunities that we're not thinking about. And so, I mean, it is directly pulled from the legislation because, well, it really was pulled from the conversations we had prior to the legislation on why we should have a Colorado Produced Water Consortium, which is why I put it, you know, in the draft of the legislation. And so, um, and so I do think this, this is important. I think we, I've heard this from folks in this room. I've heard it from folks that have been involved before. I think that those, those barriers and opportunities end up being a really important 
um, you know, a, a really important conversation because I think there are some some real challenges associated with it. So, excellent. Thanks. Thank you so much, Irene. Thanks, Irene Andrus. I just wanted to capture what I had talked about earlier, and you said should come under policy Please. is that. Part of the permitting process should include a water plan where people state where they're planning to get their water from and what they're going to do with the um, the produced water that, that they create. And that the ECMC in the permitting, what they do is they look at that cumulatively and how all of the wells that are in that area, um, the, the entire impact. John, would you help with that, please? Sure. Um, I mean, first of all, we do we do require a water plan as part of the applications, and so that that already that already happens. Um, and the water plan evaluates more than it addresses, uh, but it does you know analyze the water that's being used. Um, and I think that the additional reporting requirements associated with uh, twelve forty two you know amplifies the amount of information that will be provided. But the legislative piece that we have as our first priority or first priority does identify that um, we are going to make recommendations on modifications to ECMC rules. And so I think that becomes a specific recommendation that you can make, you know, when we're tackling that particular question. Um, I also think that, um, you know, in this context, I don't know as that's a strategic result. I think that there would be some consideration that could be made to have that as a strategy. Um, but I really see that more as a, a debate or a conversation that can happen within this group as we start to think about what needs to be in, included in ECMC rulemaking around produced water, you know, as per our recommendations. So, well, we're going to make recommendations to ECMC on modification of rules. They have to have the, well, me, we have to have the rulemaking done by like end of year 2024, which means we have to really have recommendations from this body in order to start that rulemaking probably July of 2024. So the conversation's coming up. Um, What phase of what? Does does the water plan include how much produced water you're going to be producing and flow back and what you're going to do with it? Right. So what I'm saying is that is part of the the, the first strategic result that we developed around legislation itself. Mm -hmm. We can also put it in here if if you want as a implementation plan uh, under the strategic result of you know what are the opportunities uh, for legislative, regulatory, or um, policy barriers or not barriers uh, opportunities uh, to reuse and recycling or produce water. Um, I'm I'm. I'm punting this a little bit because what you're suggesting is not going to immediately become a consensus item in this room. And it's probably about a two hour debate. Um, and so that's right. Um, and so I'm not sure that that's, I don't think we have time to deal with that right now. Yeah. So Tessa Swanson, just to circle us back around a bit, and this is more a question maybe for both um, Chair Mister and Marv, what we're talking about right now is the goals, specifically the measurable date-specific goals of what to do around legislation and policy, correct? Is there anything beyond or enhancing what is written already in the legislative bill that we really need to talk about? Because otherwise, I think they're already laid out, correct? What we're asking for is anything beyond those or combining those into clear language? I, I feel like we're spending a lot of time talking about what we already know we have to do. I so, concur. Oh, 
Someone was talking. Kevin, I concur. Um, I hear I hear what you guys are saying. So for brevity, this is that. But Tessa, I will re remind you that this consortium lives beyond this legislation. And there's lots of considerations around legislative issues, policy issues, regulatory issues that um, it would be my hope that this legis uh, that this consortium is you know, interested in looking at and really becoming the um, the research and policy body around produced water for the state of Colorado. And so I'm really less. I think that we need to accomplish the deliverables in the legislation, and certainly these pieces were included in the legislation, um, mostly because the legislation drafters were given the draft of why we created the Produce Water Consortium in the beginning before it was formally done. And so I just don't want us to lose this in trying to just accomplish the deliverables of the legislation. I so, completely agree. Uh, and so what I what I was saying was not a statement. It was a question for the consortium. Obviously, one of those strategic goals should be to accomplish by the date specified each of the goals written into legislation. And we do have that. So what would I have not heard a suggestion that has gone beyond any of those yet because written into that is identifying barriers and creating pathways for reuse and recycling. And I'm I'm not saying I have a suggestion. I don't. I hesitate to suggest a problem and not a solution. But I haven't seen something beyond what we've been mandated to do as a suggestion for a second goal. And I'd love to hear one. So uh, as a consultant, I looked at the, at the legislation and did as a team those are very neat specific kinds of things, right? However, the consortium really doesn't even consider sunsetting until 2030, I think it is, right? So what this is, is like a, a, a long-term consistent commitment that goes beyond what's required by a certain date in the legislation. That's, that's what I would say. That what's in the legislation about proposing regulation, policy and legislation, is false in the context of this, but this is a broader context and probably will take you to places that you're really not thinking about uh, or weren't thinking about when you did the legislation because new new areas will emerge. I looked at it as just a short-term and long-term thing. So, so that was that was my view. So and and to be specific, like as an action item, there's nothing in the legislation I think that contemplates um utilization of non-tributary water in um you know in oil and gas activities and so i think that's a potential opportunity that could be explored in this conversation that's not prescriptive in the legislation so i have a housekeeping thing we have reached one o'clock if you do need to leave please feel free to do so but those of you who can stay about um, 10 minutes, 10 minutes late, I would really appreciate um, being able to finish this, this part. So, oh, Mike Freeman. Uh, thank you. I, I had one thought to Tessa's point about whether we want to uh, include a, um, a, an action item that, that goes beyond just the statutory requirements. And a few minutes ago, someone mentioned the uh, the idea of uh, identifying and recommend minimum threshold standards for produced water reuse, both, both in field and outside the oil field. Um, and I think that might be one worth including here. Yeah, I think I, I, I agree. I, I take the point that it could be incorporated into the ones that are up there with the statutory mandate. But I also think those are would be an important piece to call out and make clear that part of our goal here and really an integral part of what we'll be trying to do here is develop recommendations to ensure that whatever is done with produced water is done in a way that's safe environmentally and, and that protects communities. So I think um, I, I, I see the point that maybe it's in, within the scope of, of the statutory mandate, but I think giving it its own separate item could be helpful in that regard. Thank you, Mike. Actually, uh, that has been drafted. And oh. that, no, thank you. Uh, that's what I'd like to review next is the languages. And Grant, you're really helpful on this. 
Darcy and I know that we didn't get the language right in the, at the last part, so we'll need some help. But it reads, by such and such a date, CPWC identifies and recommends minimum thresholds. And we said we had minimum treatment thresholds, but maybe it's just minimum thresholds for infield reuse recycling and other uses such as ag, non potable or consumable produced water. So I, we know that the last part needs work, right? And we know the expertise to do that is in the room. But the question I'd ask you, we can, we can work on that language, it'd be great, you'll help us, is do you want a strategic result that says that you will identify and recommend minimum thresholds for reuse and recycling? Kevin? I, I think you're starting to list things again. Right. Um, is that what we want to do? So that's why I'm stopping right here, right now. You could just say, and other beneficial uses or uses outside of oil and gas. Okay. Ra rather than listing. And, and other, what did you say? Other beneficial uses. Thank you. We knew we needed help. I'm curious for EPA weigh in here. Um, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I get a little twitchy, uh, the reuse outside the oil field, especially when it's in close approximation to consumption. Uh, there's a lot we do not know about produced water. EPA is undergoing some studies right now. Um, so I would just be careful saying you're going to set thresholds for what is safe or risk, you know, risk-based. Okay for outside use, that would be my two cents. And, and tell us- If it's human consumption, if it's for industrial purposes, that's a different story. Right, and, and let's focus on industrial specifications and I would take out treatment thresholds. Right. Right, I would that, just take out minimum was, volume was, thresholds, was, honestly. So if that was the goal of the legislation, the way it, it says in our overall arching goal here from what they handed out for this the primary goal of Colorado Produce Water Consortium is to help reduce the consumption of fresh water within oil and gas um, operations. Then a minimum threshold volume wise, not treatment spec wise, because I believe what uh, to saying on the beneficial we, reuse. We treatment. Yeah, it, well, that is where our data gaps are, exactly. right? I, I know, and I think the people in the room in the industry understand what we can do in field reuse that's environmentally safe, uh, because it's deep injection, we don't want to get into it, but if you're using it for either potable or non-potable surface discharge, or, that's a whole nother ball of wax. Right. And so I don't even know if that needs to be on there. And I don't know if it, I guess my question originally, is that even inside the purview of this consortium? It's a, I think it's a tack on that we need to consider down the road, but with the specific agenda for our deliverables, right, that are March. June, May, like that sort of thing. You just mentioned, you mentioned, just mentioned, you know, the proper we can't carry it. I was referring to Commissioner Messer's comment that this consortium will live beyond uh, 1242. So um, I'm also twitchy to think about use outside the field, um, but if we're going to view that as a future task for this consortium to look at it, that doesn't mean you'd bless it, but consider it. Um, that's why I, I was just using the general term, other beneficial uses. And I agree with that part. I would just say that if you're putting it underneath a minimum volume for external, for beneficial reuse outside the oil field, those two don't seem to go together because the considerations for beneficial reuse outside the oil field are treatment specs versus right. volume. And so I wasn't it? thinking about volume. I was thinking when we said minimum thresholds, we're talking about what's in the water. Water quality. Exactly. Right, water quality. Not volumes. And I think that's a separate issue. Yeah. So I, I, I'm going to make a suggestion. I think we got enough attrition going on here today, Marv, that, um, <laughs> that, that we put that one in the parking lot and that maybe we can re- re look at that one at a future meeting and make a determination we can even rethink the whole the whole strategic priority here because I, I would acknowledge that we have had not had enough conversation and I'm, i feel like now we're rushing it and maybe 
there needs to be a little more conversation on this one. We, and so, um, and so maybe we, maybe we take a pause on that okay. one. We've got four out of the five done. I think we've got plenty of work to do implementation planning on those. And I don't think we're going to identify legislative regulatory or policy um, between now and December. Unlikely. Yeah. So I'm open to if people who want to keep chewing on it, but um, do you want to come back to this briefly in December? I think, well, we'll come back to it briefly at the appropriate time. I don't know. I have to think about December, um, but I want to let you all wrap up before I give just a couple of comments uh, at the end of the meeting here about upcoming meetings. Okay. Uh, first of all, congratulations. This is like a world speed record for strategic planning. Uh, Darcy and I think you've done remarkably good work here this morning. Uh, and I would we would agree that this last one needs more consideration. This is a good start, but I think that you really are very solid on four of your strategic priorities, which is really remarkable. And I think the next steps are to consider uh, perhaps this priority, but then also move toward implementation strategies. Not only for this, but also in the shorter term for um, achieving the benchmarks in the legislation. Uh, I think that's probably short term. That's where the implementation strategy that needs to be developed for you to consider really need to initially uh, begin focusing. So um, just remarkable, everyone. Congratulations. And thank you. Yeah, thanks, Marv. Let's give Marv a, a round of applause for, for helping us out here. Um, really appreciate you and Darcy coming and 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 being involved with us. Um, I know everyone's leaving now, but I am going to ask for folks to do a little bit of homework um, because we do have some a, a meeting in December, beginning of December, and as that meeting, I would like to at least incorporate a portion of that meeting on a, 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 an education topic. And so I want us to, I want to be able to develop a, a topic of, um, or, or a presentation for folks that they think is really important as we start to dive in some of these next steps. So I don't want you to identify it right now, but I want you to think about it and I want you to email Hope and I um, and, and just provide suggestions generally on education topics, things that we need to know about, things that we need to learn about, whether that's water law, whether that's, um, you know, ECMC regulations or CDPA regulations or federal regulations or, you know, wh whatever the topics may be. Let's start to develop a list so we can start to schedule these presentations so that we can get a baseline of information, you know, continue to build that baseline of information. And then, um, and then hope is already working on, you know, timelines and schedules and, you know, how we're going to start to implement these things. And, uh, at least some of the implementation plan will be drafted by next meeting for this consortium to be able to react to. Um, and, uh, and then we'll start down this road of, of doing this work that we do. I mean, do understand that we've got a deliverable due on March 1st, which means if this consortium wants to review it, then that deliverable has to be accomplished in the first meeting in February. We've got another deliverable that's due May 1st. And then if this consortium, I mean, if this consortium wants to have input on it, then we need to be reviewing that in March and April. Um, we've got another deliverable after that due in June. Oh, yeah, I remember. Um, and so things are happening and we need to be like on top of it and rolling through things and having these conversations and making some decisions. And um, I, I am concerned about the timeline. I mean, I think it's super, super tight. And so we're going to have to do a lot of work on this. And so um, uh, but anyway, uh, not to start on a negative, really love what we accomplished today. And uh uh, this is big. This is big to actually have strategic results in hand and be able to start moving down this road and really starting to get to work on this stuff and just know that decisions that we make are going to be tied to this. And so if someone's like comes up at a meeting, it's like, hey, we really should do this. You know, I'm going to say, show me in our strategic results, you know, where that idea 
falls. And if it falls outside of our strategic results, then we're then then that's probably not going to be a priority for us right now because we have a lot to do that's going to be directly related to this stuff. So, um, all right. Well, thanks everyone. Have we'll safe travels you. home. There you go. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you.